Councilor Smith. Here. Councilor Zika. Here. Mayor Quill. Here. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to this great republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can you remain standing for a moment of silent prayer or reflection? Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> we will start out, as always, with our uh, public to be heard. If you read our rules and regulations, please. <clears throat> At this time, we will open the public to be heard portion of our council meeting. As a reminder, and pursuant to council rules of procedure, prior to addressing council, speakers are asked to state their name, address, and affiliation, if any. All comments should be addressed to the entire council and not to individual staff members. Your remarks should be limited to three minutes and concern only issues involving the city council, city government, or matters of general city concern. Issues involving specific employees of the city should be directed to the city manager outside of this meeting. All speakers before council should observe commonly accepted rules of courtesy. Personal attacks or abusive language will be ruled out of order. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Legislator Lattimore. Good afternoon. Um, I'd just like to uh, um, congratulate all the winners from the primary, Mr. Smith, Mr. Graney, um, our uh, Debbie McCormick, Mr. Cuddy is here, congratulations. Um, I'd just like to uh, also say that uh, uh, the 9-11 ceremony the other day, uh, I really appreciated the, the fact that we were all there together honoring uh, our beloved personnel that, that passed away and the civilians. Um, I have to go to a county meeting now. Uh, Mr. Mahunik, good Democrat, is uh, head of the Health and Human Services. I hope that uh, uh, Democrats and Republicans can work together. I know that uh, during the primary battle there was a lot of conversation in regards to who's a good Democrat or who's a good Republican. Hopefully it's uh, it's for the citizens of this community that we work together, both the city and the county, whether we're Republicans or Democrats. So I hope that Mr. Mahonick doesn't, uh, as chairman of the health services, uh, uh, doesn't get too upset with me for being a little late. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lattimore. Is there anyone else desiring to be heard this evening? Good evening, uh, City Council, Mr. Mayor. I have a letter from the City okay. Council. Okay, sure. Then you can, your name and address for the record, please. Yeah. Thank you. Kevin Cox, 127 Genesee. Uh, Mr. Mayor, since time is short, as I well know, um, I just wanted to uh, read the, the letter I handed up uh, into the record. Mr. Smith, by the way, I'm glad to see you're feeling better. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, dear City Council, in addition to the issues raised in our September uh, 5th, 2013 letter, the Jim Napoleon letter dated July 26, 2012, the Jim Napoleon affidavit dated February 18, 2013, and the Daniel Vavone affidavit dated March 15, 2013, there remain major health and safety issues for the proposed theater with respect to State Street in the rear alleyway. Appendix D of the State Fire Code requires an unobstructed fire apparatus access road at least 26 feet wide since the proposed theater is over 30 feet high. Mr. Lynch and Mr. Fusco admit in the secret documentation that this issue is a secret issue, but defer the resolution uh, of this off until the issuance of a building permit. This is a clear violation of the secret law. Furthermore, the representations made by Mr. Hicks, Mr. Digert, and Mr. Tanner that, there's a, uh, that the project is exempt from state fire code requirements is false. In fact, in taking the position, they're essentially admitting that State Street does not comply with fire code. They claim that a fire apparatus access road cannot be installed because of the location on the property, topography, waterways, non-negotiable grades, or other similar conditions. They further claim that State Street is a pre-existing street that is not <clears throat> owned by the county or college, and that they have no authority to make changes. Both of these claims are completely without legal merit. First, the City Council is lead agency on this project and does in fact have authority to make changes to the configuration of State Street. In this coordinated review, the City must ensure that State Street is in compliance. 
Secondly, <clears throat> State Street is a public street which is too narrow and obstructed by parking on both sides of the street. Changes can easily be made to the configuration to bring it within compliance. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, the college has been given access to work beyond its property boundaries well into State Street, tearing up the sidewalks, portions of the street, placing crane pads down, and essentially shutting down State Street during the construction. And I've attached drawing L-101 from the revised plans, which uh, clearly show that the college plans on doing just that. Um, and as I note in my letter, I'm not aware of any city resolution that authorized the college to do this. Um, the college with its partners the Musical Theater Festival should spend the necessary resources to make the proposed theater safe. There should be no question as to fire code compliance, especially in light of the fact that the college's own students are involved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Mr. Davis. Mayor of City Council. <clears throat> uh, some time ago when, um, oh, sorry, Norman J. Davis, how the commission of the city of Auburn, New York, a great city. Not too long ago, our former police chief, Gary Donato, warned this city council of the impending drug problem that's festering in our city. And believe he was, he hit it right on the money because it is infesting our neighborhoods. I've gotten calls and I've watched myself here. So I'm hoping that this council or, or even a new council that starts up in December can really figure out a way to address this problem because the, uh, the people in our neighborhoods don't deserve this. The biggest investment they have are their homes and they deserve to come to a neighborhood that's free of drugs. And I just wanted to bring it back to council's attention to what our former police chief did say, that it is increasing in this city. And I hope and pray that council can do something about it as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else desiring to be heard this evening? Good evening. My name is Justin Huffman from the Camarda Law Firm, 127 Genesee Street. Uh, I'd like to put all of you on notice right now that should the city approve a condition negative declaration tonight, without first conducting the soil and groundwater testing that we have been pleading for for weeks now, each one of you will be in violation of both the Appellate Division's June 8, 2012 order and Judge Polito's May 9, 2013 order. I am passing out a letter to all of you right now on this issue. The appellate division found the potential for a significant adverse environmental impact based upon the contamination found in soil vapor tests. Again, at least 23 volatile organic compounds have been detected at the site. Now we're not talking about UFOs here, as Mr. Fusco seems to mock our concerns. I must say here, there have been two secret declarations on this matter before, and we've been get successful in getting both overturned at this point, despite the counseling for both Mr. Fusco and Ms. Marsh. You can take their advice and ignore our concerns for a third time, or you can listen to our concerns and ensure that the review is done right. This isn't about voting yes or no on the theater. This is about environmental review and making sure the occupants and neighbors, such as you and me, are protected. I also passed out to you a letter to each of you about problems that we have with the record that Mr. Fusco has provided to you. Quite frankly, it's a mess. With documents, missing pages. Mayor, I'm... You heard the rules earlier. You're not to attack people, you're to address the issue. And your constant remarks against Mr. Fusco are out of order. And I'm gonna ask the mayor to hold you out of order if you continue in that fashion. The record provided to you is missing pages, missing attachments, has incorrect attachments, and has other various problems that we describe in our letter. Again, please look carefully at this project before voting tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else desiring to be heard this evening? Anyone else? We'll close that portion of our meeting. In the future, if anyone brings in paperwork, such as the letters were shared today, we do need a copy also for the, besides the mayor and the council, we also need a copy for the clerk. 
So if one could be provided for the record, that would be greatly appreciated. It saves us a lot of copy and time and effort. So. Mayor, along those lines, um, I want to make sure that all documents are recorded with the clerk before they're passed out to staff members. They need to be documented. They're a uh, public document, and um, that, that procedure needs to be followed in the future. I, I'm not following you, Council. I'm sorry. In regards to documents that are provided right. to the Council, they need to be handed over to the clerk so she can make proper um, note of those uh, documents, make sure they're entered into the public record before they're passed out to staff or anybody else. And, and that's, 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 that's my request. That's along the lines. I just want to make sure that procedure is followed in the future. And um, we don't, we don't um, you know, we don't, we follow that procedure. So I want to make sure my point is taken. <clears throat> city manager, if you'll make note of that. Yes. Please. Acting city manager. Uh, approval meeting minutes from August 22nd, 2013. Do we have a sponsor? Councilor Camardo, seconded by Councilor Graney. Discussion? Yes, the, uh, the meeting minutes are incomplete. Um, nowhere in here does it talk to me, talk to the objections that I read about the, uh, the draft secret that was read by uh, Mr. Lynch. And also when I did the discussion of fire code safety, when I asked and requested some documentation regarding the, uh, sub, uh, to substantiate the fire chief's thing, orders uh, or ruling that it was uh, compliant, that the corporate, assistant corporate counsel said that no, we, you can't have that because we'll be sued on it. I want that entered into the record. Everyone in this chamber that was present at the time heard that. Counsel? Um, I just want to, um, it's one thing I know, unfortunately we ran out of tape. I guess the, the tape ran out at That's correct. Nine, 9 o'clock. I don't know what time, but it ran out. Um, shouldn't there be more detailed, um, seeing that was our only official document, shouldn't there be more detailed? Uh, the tape minutes? is not the official document. The minutes of the clerk are the official document. Isn't that a follow And they don't have to be verbatim. But isn't that a follow-up of counsel? Do we have some kind of... A record on what actually happened during council meetings. The only meetings. thing I have to record are, are votes, really. The action taken, not the debate. Well, I request that that be pl right. placed in the minutes. Just, just hang on one second. How do we, how do we, in the future, I just want to make sure that we have something, not only in this regard, but if something happened with the video or audio, that somebody could revert back to that for what was actually. The minutes? The minutes, yes. The only way you would do that is if you had verbatim minutes. I'm not, I would not be um, comfortable trying to interpret what you say verbatim. Well, that's why we have a that's why we have an audio or a visual right. backup on it, that. Right, but the record that I do is I record the actions taken by council throughout the meeting and the public to be heard, that kind of thing. But I don't I don't um, record what Peter says. Well, I'm not saying Peter. I'm just saying anybody. If, if anybody. we didn't have an audio Even or visual, even the public to be heard, I summarize what. I know you do, but we still have an audio, or somebody can look back since, and see. It. Since it was since tape was invented, yes. Um, prior to that, it's just um, the recordings of a, a clerk. There's the legal. I strike me down if I'm wrong, but I, I've been told for the last 13 years, it's the I record the actions, the votes actions that council take, which are the votes. Well, that's up to council if we want to change that procedure or not. Sure, assume. if you yeah. want verbatim minutes, then you'd have to hire a stenographer. Well, if we don't have a video, I think we need a verbatim. But you, you would ask if audio. I bring a, a right. audio, which the, the, uh, the video, what happened that time hasn't ever happened. Why, as long as I've been here, it hasn't happened too. Uh, you're absolutely right, right. but so I just want to make sure in the future that it's something like that didn't hit, right. it ran it's out. Never happened. We would have something to back it up, or somebody would be taking hand notes and you know. If if you wanted that, you'd have to hire a stenographer. <coughs> well, we, we Councilor Councilor Green, I know you wanted to yeah, speak, yeah. but go ahead, go ahead, please. I, I just want a clarification from corporate council on that. Sure. Yeah, exactly what I said previously that the tape is a public service. Basically, uh, it has no official um, uh, blessing by law, it's not required by law, the law just requires that there be minutes that do not have to be verbatim. And that's, those are the minutes that she uh, records, and there probably will be statements or matters that would be left off. And again, uh, I've checked this out on many occasions, that's the only way uh, that this can be uh, 
facilitated if you want something verbatim the audio uh, and uh, the, the tape would not be official you'd have to hire a stenographer to be the official uh, person transcribing the minutes and then uh, verifying them you're absolutely right but it also states <coughs> that it's up to the body whoever's taking the minutes to follow through on what kind of minutes they well, I think that's, that's right. your call and that's our call as a council what what kind of minutes we want to have taken in the future I don't have a problem with the way we're going but I just have a problem in case the audio runs out how do we how do we fix that problem and I we talked about it last time we're gonna have a, um, a video or backup on that but in the meantime how do we take care of the problem that existed this past two weeks well the audio I would have a backup audio I which I've never had because we've never had that problem I think right. it was a once in a lifetime problem right Steve it's never happened before I just just never happened again hopefully yeah but we'll have an audio backup but as far as the meeting council Rizik is referring to I I just record as much as I can for the resolutions public to be heard I never would try to interpret in writing the conversations well maybe we should add better better direction that evening on how to take care of the problem that existed however I, my statement stands everyone that was present in this council chamber heard that statement if it comes down to this and let's say this gets back in the, in the court and everybody in the, that was present gets subpoenaed and under oath they better say the truth I would hope they would swear to the truth when <coughs> they're subpoenaed regardless of what the understood but I'm just telling you that that statement was said verbatim no you can't have that we'll get sued may I be heard on this mr. mayor um, <laughs> we, we were mr. Fusco please we're here uh, I was what I my recollection was I number one I didn't say sued in 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 reference to what mr. Rizika is talking about my recollection is that mr. Rizika was requesting that we get some type of opinion letter uh, from chief Digart, something that would be created in addition to that which he had and and my advice at that particular time was I don't think we should create additional papers for liability reasons so that's my recollection of what happened on August 22nd uh, there was a subsequent request by Peter for any field notes or drawings or photographs uh, which which the chief may have taken in relation to his staging of the vehicles on State Street and those were handed over you were all provided copies of those uh, with your packets for last week's meeting but but it, just just so that we're clear what I when I said what I said my understanding Pete is what you were asking for was some type of opinion letter to be generated by the chief or, or to be drafted by the chief and that, that I don't think is necessary his signing of the uh, acceptance of the exception together with Mr. Hicks and Mr. Tanner constitutes his opinion that and I hope that clarifies it. well I, I've got all I've saved all the email traffic that I had with Doug regarding that and he sustained your position saying that the, I couldn't have the, the documentation that I asked for and I said well you have it right here in your dissertation from Mr. Lynch that these documents are it's a public document I had to fight tooth and nail to get those documents you you or Doug did not want to release them to me and I had to be very blunt and f forward with it no that's I, I, number one Pete I didn't know that they even existed until the chief gentlemen uh, till the chief uh, shared them with us so gentlemen. no it, there was no intention of with, withholding anything Last from time. you or any other member of council I, I, I'll, I'll share the emails with the press and let them make that determination gentlemen we have a we have a motion on the floor and second no further any further discussion Clerk, if you'll call the roll, please. This I'll in regards to the approval of meeting minutes. I, no, I asked for an amendment. I, you have to have a second for that. Is there a second? Hearing no second, we'll move to the original minutes. Councilor Mayor, and, forget, and, I, and I apologize for my abrupt exiting last week. Um, but can I, can I ask this one question? Please. 
if, if it's in regard to the it, meeting minutes, I, I, I would assume, yeah. Oh, not to the minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to the project. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. Council Grady? Yes. Got lost here. Council Marto? I think somebody should have um, taken some kind of minutes in regard to this here, seeing there was a problem with the audio, so I'm going to vote no. Councilor Smith? Aye. Council Rizzi? No. Mayor Quill? Aye. Carried. Our first presentation, the STAR program presentation by Jeff Lowe and Bev Howard from New York State Department of Transaction Taxation. Good evening. Um, it's Jeff Lowe from New York State Tax and Finance um, Real Property Division. What I wanted to come out here today was to a um, little more public information about the STAR re-registration program. Um, most people have heard about it. We were out at the State Fair re-registering um, people for the STAR program. And I just wanted to go over it in you know, different um, city council meetings, county legislator meetings, school board meetings. Um, we want to make sure that everybody gets um, re-registered that is deserving of it. The reason we started this um, program was um, New York State Comptroller did an audit of the STAR program and they found up, I guess it was kind of like an estimate up to 13 million in um, fraud, whether it was intentional or unintentional in the STAR program. So it was decided that we should go through and try to re-register everyone, okay? So, um, main, the main question is going to be which part of the star gets re-registered, and it's going to be the basic star. So, um, taxpayers who are 65 and older that receive the enhanced star need to re-register on a yearly basis um, anyway, so it really has no effect on them. It's more for your basic, which is younger than 65, with less than a $500,000 income. Yeah. And it just requires all homeowners receiving the basic start to re-register with the tax department, not with their local assessor or with the county. Um, it applies to 2.6 million um, taxpayers. And, and you know, if you have any questions, we'd like you to call the Department of Taxation and Finance, not your local assessor. Question for you: sure do, do they have to re-sign up for a star once you're into the program? That's what a lot of people have asked. Uh, once you're, you know, I guess into the program, is it an automatic renewal or is it something you have to um, renewal? For this year, everybody has to renew, and then after this year, they haven't decided if it's going to be um, a biannual thing or um, every other year, basically. So everybody has to. Everybody sign. has to re-register at this time. Just so we make that clear that yes, people are received not the basic confused start. about that. Correct. If you received the basic star last year, you need to re-register um, this year. And a lot of it came down to some assessors had, which I mean, it's it's comical, but it's not. Had people getting a star exemption on vacant parcels, mm -hmm. on commercial property. Um, so, being that star is. I guess reimbursed by state funds to have the local assessors monitoring it seemed like maybe not such a good idea to put it easily. So that's where this whole process came through and I know it's going to be um, filled with errors but you know it seemed like to save the state millions of dollars on a yearly basis we we're uh, giving it a shot. Um, Purpose is a su successful implementation will ensure that everybody gets the STAR program who are qualified to get the STAR exemption and it'll eliminate fraud, whether it's <laughs> unintentional or intentional. Um, there's a lot of times that it's unintentional where people get married, rent out their, um, the husband's or the wife's 
house and the star exemption stays on that property when in actuality it should be removed. Oh, could you elaborate on uh, what is a uh, qualified homeowner? Qualified homeowner? Yes. Okay, it's a homeowner who's younger than 65, making less than 500,000, and <coughs> lives in their primary residence. So any homeowner in the state that falls into that category is qualified to receive the star exemption, the basic star exemption. It's, it's meant to hit every property owner in the state. So the process is gonna be, tax and finance is gonna, we collected all the 2013 assessment rolls. We um, designated a unique star code for every basic star exemption that was on each roll for each taxpayer. And we, mail, we started mailing out letters to all the homeowners with this star code and how to register. And to register, you receive your letter, it has a star code on it. You either can call our web, or call our um, hotline, tax and finance hotline, or you can register online through our website. If you lose the letter and you lose your star code, you can go online and look it up. You put in your property address and it'll give you your star code. Okay. Mike, how long does this registration period go? Goes through, um, well, we're hoping to catch everybody by December 31st. Okay. So we've been out, I mean, most people have heard about it. I know there's plenty of signs hanging up here in City Hall. Um, the letters have gone out. We've been at State Fair. It's been on the news, in the newspaper. But I'm sure there's going to be people that get missed, and there'll probably be a grace period. Um, but we're looking to catch everybody by December 31st. If, if people, though, for those that haven't registered by December 1st, they'll be receiving a second letter at the beginning of December. And this is for next year's school tax. This correct? is for next year's school taxes, correct. Now, now I received the letter and it's, and it's very easy to do. Um, in fact, you can even do it right over the phone. Yes, I did it, on the, did it by the phone because no one else in our office, everybody else was doing it online. And we're actually going to be registering people outside here using the iPad for those that would like to register tonight. Do you have any workshops set up at City Hall, we'll say, or any of the areas where somebody can come in and you could help them through the process, or is that our local assessor can ha have that happen? The local assessor can have that happen, and, and we are exploring any avenue we can okay. at this time. Um, we're just trying to hit the most amount of people for what we can. Um, as much time as we spent at the State Fair, I believe we signed up approximately 5,000 people, which when you look at the big picture out of 2.6 million, isn't a lot, but we're putting the effort for it right, right now. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the online registration, like we discussed, okay. you go on to our tax and finance website <coughs> and you walk through the steps. Um, there is the necessity, you need your star code, so if you don't have that letter, you can always look it up right on our website. Okay. The one catch that a lot of people do have an issue with is you do need your social security number, and it does need to be entered or giving, given over the phone. I know there's a lot of people that aren't happy with that, but it's the only way tax and finance can track everybody and separate out who's getting more than one. Okay. And <coughs> state tax and finance will um, confirm that the income is less than 500,000 for husband and wife or property owners. And then tax and finance sends a list to the assessor, letting them, the assessor know what exemptions should or shouldn't be on the file. And this is one thing that um, we feel for the assessor because people that might be denied certain exemptions, um, there's no recourse that the assessor can help with. All calls or issues need to be handled by tax and finance. And then here's somewhat of our registration schedule. 
we started mailing out letters for the central area, Syracuse area back in August before the state fair and by October 4th, everybody in the state will have received their letter or the letters for all regions will be have sent out. And then December 1st, like I said earlier, the second notice will go out for those who haven't registered yet. And the deadline is December 31st. That's what we're shooting for. But we anticipate possible issues. Okay. And any appeals process for those that um, have their star removed will be directed through tax and finance, not through the usual grievance board for municipalities. And again, just to look up their car code, your star code, you go to Department of Taxation and Finance website, and there's a way to go right in there and look up your code to sign up. And now, I'm, I don't know if there is, like Councilman Camardo brought up, other ways to get the word out, so to speak, but you know, we're, we're considering this a critical issue and we're trying to hit as much as we can for our avenue and um, mass media to let everybody know, okay? And the new star applications, because the, um, the letters are based on homeowners who own property in 2013, for those, um, I guess, new homeowners that purchased houses after July 1st, 2013, they will be given a star exemption or they will have to fill out the, I guess the old way, the star registration form, hand it into their assessor and tax and finance as of July will send them a letter and they'll have to call and re-register for the star exemption. And for more information, visit our website or here's a number to call. And if for those taxpayers who need more, they can contact the assessor and the assessor will call our office. And again, for anybody who is interested, we'll have the iPad out, out in the hallway registering whoever needs to be or would like to be registered. Very good. Any questions? Jeff, the city and county have been trying very hard in the last few years to work together. I'll ask the city manager, maybe they could work with the county in sponsoring an event or two where people can come in and register. As you say, it looks very simplistic, but there are still a lot of people uh, that are not in it. Uh, comfortable working on the internet or whatever but the phone is available but at the same time we'll see what we can do to come up with some type of a uh, uh, seminar yes. here here in the county so. yes I know we'll be at a, the Auburn school board meeting and we'll be at the county legislator meeting this and this month and next month Very also um, and I know there are there are plenty of people there are thousands or tens of thousands of Amish in the state that also don't have social security numbers so it is a it is a big process. Okay. All right. All right. Jeff, Thank you. One quick question. Oh, you know how yeah. many people this affects in Auburn? In Auburn? Yeah. No, I do not. I'm, I know there are 7,200 residential properties in the city, and obviously many of them are right. multi units and maybe aren't owned, I guess, mm -hmm. primary residence of the owner. So I would assume it'd be at least 5,000, 5,500. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, they'll be in the hallway if anybody wants to uh, sign up for their star or, or stay around here and watch for the stars, so. <laughs> <laughs> Next we have Katie Jacob, Oscar Lake Watershed. to try to address everybody here. 
and just facing the floor. Right, so I just want to do a quick introduction of myself and the program before I get started. I know I'm kind of on a schedule, so if I start going over, just give me the, the sign here. Take all the time you want, Katie. Uh, thank you, Mike. <laughs> well, my name is Katie Jacob, and I... Katie, you oh, use the microphone. Right here? Okay, I'm sorry. All right, my name is Katie Jacob. I work for the Owasco Lake Watershed Inspection Program. Um, I started working back in 2011 under my predecessor, Jess Reinhardt, when she left in the August of 2011. I kind of took over for her, and I've been here ever since. Uh, prior to that, I graduated from Paul Smith College with a Natural Resource Management and Policy degree. I grew up in the area. Um, I'm from Montezuma, and the Finger Lakes have really been kind of an integral part of me wanting to go forward and get my Natural Resource degree. And, and here I am now. Working for the program, uh, you really got to know your stats. Um, it, it may seem simple, and they're just numbers, but this is Owasco Lake. Um, it's a smaller lake, but still, it's our lake. It's Owasco. It's about 10 and a half miles long. We got 25 miles of shoreline to work with. 90% uh, of it, 95% of it is developed. And most of that 90% are on still on uh, private septic systems as well. Uh, it's about 260 billion gallons, that's the volume. Average width is about 1.2 miles. Uh, depth, about 96 feet, 177, and the deepest part. And the time it takes for one raindrop to get from the Owasco Inlet to the Owasco Outlet is about three to four years, which is actually really good when you look at Cuga Lake and Seneca Lake, which can take about seven to 10 years for all the water in that lake to replenish itself. And that just goes to show that our lake to watershed ratio is huge. We have the largest lake to watershed ratio out of, all, out of any of the Finger Lakes. That's what really makes Owasco Lake stand out. And that means for every one square mile of lake that we have, there are 20 square miles of watershed. So that means that whatever we do on our watershed, whatever we do on that land, is no matter what, it's going to affect how, you know, what our water quality is going to be. Um, which is, it's, it's, it's pretty, I mean, it's, it's pretty important. And as you can see, about roughly about two thirds of the watershed is south of Moravia. That's where a lot of your water is gonna be coming from. I'll show you in um, uh, the next slide that um, the Owasco Inlet is actually responsible for over half of the water that's coming into our lake. So that's where we really need to be focusing our efforts, that's where we need the involvement. But I'll get, all, I'll get to that. There are 17 uh, municipalities total. There's about 170 square miles in Cuga County. There's about five square miles in Onondaga County. And there's about 30, 33 square miles in Tompkins County. So it's, it's not just a Cuga County thing. We gotta you know, work with soil and water districts, county governments from three different counties. So it's really, it's a group effort. Um, the program's only about, maybe seven years old or maybe six years old, but it's, I mean, it's, it's a working effort and we're getting there. Uh, as you can see, these are our, these are our watersheds each. I mean, we have our full 208 square mile um, Owasco Lake watershed, but we also have several sub watersheds within that. As you can see, like I mentioned earlier, um, the Owasco Inlet is responsible for 55% of the water coming into the lake. Uh, so odds are the water that you're drinking probably comes from the Owasco Inlet at some point. Uh, we did a lot of work this year on Dutch Hollow Brook, which is the second largest tribu uh, tributary into Owasco Lake. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, Vaness and Sucker Brook on the northern ends, and then we have about 40 intermittent uh, feeder streams. Um, you know, nine months out of the year, they're running dry, but when we get rain like we did today, and especially this spring, they were, they were really rushing. We were focusing a lot of our efforts actually on a lot of the feeder streams because you know, they seem so docile. You know, like I said, nine months out of the year, but we get two inches of rain in you know, two hours and they become this raging torrent. And we actually had a lot of issues on the southern end of the watershed where 
um, well, a lot of what we do is um, we just go and consult with landowners who have issues. And um, on the southern, on the southwestern part of the lake, there were three or four different incidences that were identical. They had these beautiful, peaceful little feeder streams that you know would run, you know, by folks' houses, and we would get all this rain. And I mean, you wouldn't believe the amount of debris and rock. I mean, it could fill, you know, half of this room that would come down and just you know, a couple hours just from all that rain that we got. So uh, with this kind of changing weather patterns that we've been experiencing lately, it's something that I wouldn't be surprised if that's what we're going to be uh, focusing our efforts on in the future. And uh, this map is just a depiction of the land use within the watershed. A little over half of the watershed is covered in ag. Um, and about, ooh, what did that say? It's about two-ish percent is residential, but believe it or not, we're about 50-50 um, between residential and ag as, as far as, you know, percentage of what we focus our efforts on. Um, just because, you know, when you have so many houses, you know, you all have been out on Owasco Lake, I'm sure, and you see house after house after house on Owasco Lake, um, they're, they're right there and that's where, you know, a lot of the priority does lie. So I think Jess Reinhardt was last here presenting in 2010. And Vicki called me about a month ago and asked me if I could give a little update. So really, what have we been up to since 2010? Um, and part of what we do is stormwater concerns. Um, this is actually a project that was just finished last fall. And it started in 2009. Um, but of course, um, lack of funds and some folks' bank accounts, you know, can kind of, you know, prolong efforts. So what we have here, I just want to give a brief, you know, overview of what we have here. There's a gentleman who just, you know, they wanted to build a house, lakefront, beautiful spot, but they had to dig away at some of the bank. And when you dig away at the toe of a bank, that's especially right next to the lake, um, that bank is just going to give away. And that's what it did. It wound up becoming a really huge water quality concern. Uh, when Jess was in the position, she had him, uh, put in a retaining wall, which you can see in the second picture on the bottom there. It failed. It happens. There was a huge rain event that happened, I think, two months after he installed it, and it failed. Finally, in 2012, um, he installed it with a little bit more careful measures. He put in some drainage uh, behind it and some uh, like really nice pebbles to allow for more water to kind of penetrate through so it doesn't just build up behind the wall and make it topple over. So that's where it's at now. We're still looking to get him to put in some kind of erosion control on the bank itself, uh, but it's looking really good now and we haven't really had any issues with it since. So that's what we like to see. If I can just, oh, okay. And these are more examples of some storm water concerns. <clears throat> this is just something that happened just this year. We had a a guy wanting to build a house, he was right next to a little intermittent, unprotected tributary, I guess is what you can call it, according to the DEC, but every tributary in the Osco Lake watershed to the program is something that we look to protect. Um, he built a house, he cleared off about, oh, maybe three quarters of an acre of land, um, was kind of careless with where he was driving his bulldozer, wind up going into that little intermittent stream that was dry at the time. And we got a whole bunch of rain. This was in June, I believe. We got a whole bunch of rain, which was, it was the eighth, but it's June on record. So, you know, of course, went and checked out the site during a rainstorm. And sure enough, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see where there's some discoloration in the water. And that is coming from the site. And that, to the DEC, is a water quality violation. But instead of getting DEC involved, I like to give the landowners kind of an ultimatum. You know, if you fix this within, you know, two days, you know, I'm gonna let it go. And so that's what he did. He installed a sill fence. I went back two days later, and it was during the same kind of heavy rainstorm. And as you can see, the sill fence was very effective. The water was running clear. There was no discoloration. That's what we like to see. We also do a lot with agriculture. Like I said, about half of what we do is ag. This is, this is a couple years old. We're still kind of monitoring it on and off. Um, this, was about 50 acres. They originally cleared the land for a housing development that, that they wanted to put up. Turns out the soils were extremely wet. <clears throat> but while they they cleared the land, you know, they bulldozed right up to, you know, 
the side of a stream bank. There was no vegetation. It looked like they drove their, they drove their equipment right through the stream. And you can see their tracks and you know that, I mean, the DEC in, uh, was called on it. Um, a few other folks were, were called. Uh, we worked with soil and water as well. And this is what it looks like after. These pictures are about a year old. I actually went out with a soil and water conservation district technician and we put in a 20 foot winter wheat buffer uh, the November before this and we went and checked on it uh, the spring after. And uh, it was looking great. They installed uh, some proper crossings in several different areas with some nice culverts to allow water to move through there without getting all muddy and nasty. Um, and the banks were, you know, becoming revegetated and they'll continue to do that. And I mean, that's, that's what you like to see. I mean, you don't want to, you know, end up with what I showed you before that. Um, another example of some issues with agriculture, sometimes you know, mistakes happen, you know, a lot, most farms have plans. You know, if they want to spread, uh, they got to make sure that it's not going to rain within, you know, 48 hours. And if it is, they have to tow it in. Well, what happened here is that some spreading went on and uh, it wasn't supposed to rain, but it did. And when it rained, it rained a lot. And you'll see in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, that's what winds up happening. A lot of phosphates, you know, get into your waterway. Spoke with the producer, spoke with the DEC, and what the DEC had him do was actually create a berm on either side of this grass drainage swale, which you can see kind of in the upper right-hand corner there. The grass drainage swale was supposed to prevent any of those contaminants to enter the water by filtering out anything that would flow through there, but because it rained so much, it, it was actually ineffective. So what they had him do was just install this earthen berm there, and it, I went and checked it out, and it was actually, it was really neat to see it working. The water collected behind that earthen berm, and when that water collected there, it was able to allow everything else that was harmful to the water and the environment to settle out before continuing on. Oh. Doing that. Uh, we also deal a lot with improper disposal of refuse. This is actually one of my favorite examples. Again, it's a couple years old, but um, it's just a contrast of photos here. During one of our, um, each, each year we do fire lane and feeder stream inspections all along the lake. And during one of the fire lane inspections, we actually found, um, it was just a homeowner association. They had this clearing in the woods next to a little stream that they used to dump anything from yard clippings, to, I mean, anything that they wanted to get rid of, you know, campfire ashes. I think there was like an old inner tube in there or something like that. And, you know, it, I mean, you know, it's, folks don't really think about it, you know, it's just sitting there, it's not in the water. But according to the Owasco Lake Rules and Regulations, which I operate off of, which are part of the New York State uh, Public Health Law, um, that's, that's not allowed. I got a hold of the um, president of the Homeowner Association. They had it cleared out within a few months. And now it looks like this beautiful clearing in the woods. You know, I, you know, they should make it into a park or something. You know, it looks just much more pleasing. This is another incident. We had, a, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, there was about 17 old junk vehicles that were within the 75 feet linear distance that the Wasco Lake Rules and Regulations allowed for, well, they would qual uh, classify that as a junkyard. Um, it took a little while, it took a little bartering back and forth, I guess is what you could say with the landowner, but he was actually able to get um, all, the, all of the vehicles out, there were actually some boats in there, um, was able to scrap it and make a whole bunch of money. Um, I wish I had an updated aerial view of what that pasture looks like now, but there's a small stream that runs within about oh, 60 feet of those cars up there. And um, he, he got everything cleared out within a few months. Um, and it's, I mean, compliance and cooperation like that is, it's not rare, but it's just, it's really good to have, especially when you have, I mean, that many cars so close to, you know, a waterway. We also do a lot of critical area seeding. Um, I don't have an exact number on the amount of acres that we've done. Um, we, we partner, I guess, what you could say, with the Cube County Soil and Water. They have a 1,000 gallon, I think it might be actually like 1,100 gallon hydro seeder. Um, 
and I mean it's it's their it's their money it's their machine but we you know work with landowners who have something like on the top there this is actually just this year I wish I had a more updated photo it's probably flourishing now with with all the rain that we've had but there was a lumber company in the southern part of the watershed that had regraded a bank they needed it seeded um, it was about three quarters of an acre they had it seeded within a week um, and when you have a bank that steep you know getting that seeded is really critical and we also I think this year alone we worked with the Swan Water Conservation District and seeded about seven ish maybe six and a half miles of uh, ditches throughout the watershed as well it may not seem like a big deal you know when you see the you know the back goes out there clearing out and dredging the dishes it, it may not seem like a big deal it may not seem like it has an effect but that it, you know those ditches are there to transport water and when those ditches are not seeded they aren't vegetated they're transporting not only water but a lot of sediment and part of my job is to keep that sediment in place so it doesn't wind up in the lake so working with swan water is I mean it's been very very beneficial so we get some before and after we also, um, each year, would like to hire on some seasonal inspectors. Uh, since I've been in, we've hired about, well, we've hired three. Uh, we hired two in the spring of 2012, one in the fall of 2012. And I was fortunate enough to have another seasonal this summer who will also be coming back, working part-time starting in October. And they do a lot of field work. If you want to be a seasonal, you've got to want to do field work. And that's the fun stuff. So, you know, they're usually not too hard to find. Um, this year, for example, um, this summer, Eli Vitale was uh, the kid I had working for the program. He actually did a lot of the Dutch Hollow Brook watershed inspections. And he probably covered close to 50 miles on foot just this summer, just trekking through the water, looking for erosion, improper disposal of refuse. Uh, depleted buffers, anything like that, and that method has actually become very, very effective. You know, you have someone out in the field looking for that stuff. He can come back to me with the GPS waypoints, with the pictures. We can put it into the into the computer, contact the landowner, and take it from there. So they're a huge help, and I'm excited to have Eli back come October. He'll be working more with the rainy season stuff. We do a lot with education and outreach. That's one of my favorite things to do, actually, with the watershed, just because I, I think it's fun, <laughs> uh, for one thing. Um, the main um, thing that we've really been working with, with education and outreach, is still have a lot to go with it, is municipality participation. Like I said, two-thirds, roughly, um, of the watershed is located south of Moravia. That's where we need the participation. However, it's been kind of a challenge because the folks down there don't get their water from a Wasco Lake so they don't really feel as if they have any kind of purpose or importance and it takes it's just gonna take a lot of going down to the town hall meetings and saying this is why we need you um, which you know we were down at Moravia I think back in May and uh, I hope we made a good impression I don't know if we've heard back from them yet um, but I'm willing to you know, keep on paying them a visit, <laughs> but uh, we'll we'll see. I I mean I I do enjoy doing that kind of stuff. Um, we also take uh, part in a Wasco Lake Day this year. It was a huge hit. It was it was great. Senator uh, Nazolio was there. He's actually the guy who got this whole program started. It's really great to meet him. I'll be taking part in conservation field days come next week, and I'll be using um, we. Uh, they, they have it at um, Emerson Park, and it's where you go and you talk to local sixth grade students about anything you know you really want to that's environmental uh, related. And this year I'm using the slide on the playground to portray you know erosion and soil runoff, things like that. So it'll be kind of fun. Um, I do a monthly eco talk as, as much as I can. You know, some months it's more difficult than others. We actually um, used part of our Emerson Foundation grant money to buy some storm drain medallions. Um, I bought 20 of them so far just to try them out. Uh, I put a few out on Martin's Point. I think there might be a couple on Burtis Point. There's a few out on uh, Koenig's Point. So if you see those little blue medallions with the fish on it, that's who they're from. And um, they look great. If you go actually out to Green Links, I think there's a whole bunch out there. We also do, um, I'm still working on these welcome packets, so whoever had just moved into the watershed, you know, if you just moved into the watershed, you're going to get a welcome packet from the Alaska Lake Watershed Inspection Program, just 
kind of introducing the program to them. We do a lot of education and awareness mailings. We do signage, as you can see on the bottom left-hand corner there. And we also assist the Owasco Watershed Lake Association with um, their annual water quality monitoring program that just wrapped up this past Tuesday. And they do a, you know, an annual report each year about that. Um, and one more note just to end on. This is really, really cool. This is actually from John Halfman. We've hired him while well, the planning department has hired him back for about five or six years, or well, eight years, I guess now, and to do some water quality monitoring within the Owasco Lake watershed. And according to the 2012 study, you know, Owasco Lake is still, I mean, still doing pretty good in terms of water quality. We're getting better year by year. Hopefully, we can keep with that trend. And I think the efforts that, you know, between the Owasco Lake Watershed Inspection Program, the Cube County Planning Department, the Health Department, Soil and Water, City of Auburn, Town of Owasco, everything that, you know, all you folks contribute to us really helps with these efforts and really helps us get those, you know, results that we're looking for. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call. I left a card and an annual report up on the podium over there. I don't think I brought enough, but please call me if you're interested. So. Tell us the condition of the lake. There's been a lot of questions on how the water quality is on the lake. Can you just touch upon that for the folks? Well, I mean, there's a lot that goes into the monitoring. Um, I can tell you right now from the, uh, from the Owasco Watershed Lake Association's um, sampling that we, we do every, every summer. They've been doing it for about 20, 25 years now. And it always seems to me that the water quality is remaining, well, the samples are coming back very consistent with the prior years. <laughs> Um, you know, it doesn't, you know, you, if you try to implement a pest management practice, um, we're actually pretty lucky with Owasco Lake because, like I said, our retention time is th three to four years, so we tend to see results fairly quickly, but they're not an overnight thing. Um, right now, um, the quality of the lake is remaining pretty consistent, but I'm not saying that we don't have pretty far to go. I mean, there's always room for improvement. Can you, Mayor? Yeah. Councilor, please. In your opinion, what can the city of Auburn do? What more can we do to, to um, help you and assist you in monitoring the lake? Oh. oh. I know you could probably go on forever. Yeah, well, do you really want me? I mean, how oh, much about time have I got here? Tell I mean, them, Katie. Y'all are, I mean, you're doing. But Katie, we need to hear this, though. Yeah, no, I mean, you're doing as much as you can right now. I mean, between Charlie Green, Bruce, Natalie, um, even myself, Bill, uh, just encouraging participation from other municipalities. I know you're the city of Auburn, but you are the folks, you are part of that 44,000 people. You are part of that over half of the county that gets their water from Owasco Lake. Um, I know, you know, we, we host the Owasco Lake Day up here at Emerson Park, um, which is, you know, great. Um, just participation from people. Um, what I do really depends, you know, not only on my eye, but everybody else's eye. I mean, if, if there's anything that you, you know, notice in the watershed, you know, this, I mean, getting results is really what we're looking for, and we can't do that without, you know, citizens and participation. If Bruce wants, if Bruce wants a comment as well, uh, please feel free. But what are we currently doing now? that is is make is having a very positive impact on the lake and it's something that we need to ramp up or need to continue to do i think it's just the education and awareness you know most folks don't realize what a watershed is or if they're even located within the watershed um, i think if we can keep working on that then we can definitely you know continue. Man, just for an example just grass clippings where you put your gr grass clippings very important because yep. a lot of it ends up in a lake so uh, a lot of the pollutants is pretty much from nature is that is there some truth to that Definitely. you know one of the main contributing factors to the lake's water quality is the, you know the amount of phosphorus that enters the lake and phosphorus, you know, you know, it comes from, you know, your septic system. It comes from manure. It comes from your pet waste. It comes from your yard clippings. But 
a lot, I mean, we're very, the soils here are very, very rich in phosphorus as it is. Uh, so they, I mean, there is some contribution there as well. So, I mean, but most people aren't aware of that though either. So education and awareness is, is huge. It may not seem like it, but it, it is. Uh, Katie, uh, just can you comment, how much of the impact on the lake quality is from the uh, stormwater runoff in the city? Uh, in the city, actually, Auburn doesn't have much because everything from the city actually goes into the Owasco outlet. So, right. Owasco, that's beyond Owasco Lake. So. Now, the the Asian clam, um, that's been, been a threat to our lake. So, one, can you educate us on, A, how much of a threat that is, and B, how can we deter that if we can? Right. Well, it's kind of hard to say. You know, I mean, we first discovered it back in uh, maybe 2008 or 2009. And they did a study again for the third year in a row to kind of gauge the population density of the Asian clam. Um, they are, you know, I guess a danger to our water quality because they do emit phosphorus. Um, but lowering the lake level, like you were able to do, like, you know, the city of Auburn was able to do last year um, to freeze out those clams, I think was very effective. Um, they were finding just mostly young clams this year, which is a good sign that, because that means that, you know, it was all this year's young, nothing from last year had survived. So continuing to do that would be a huge contribution. Yeah, Bruce, want to comment on that? Bruce Natalie from County Planning, but also Auburn resident. Uh, yeah, with the clams, I, th I think one of the things is we, we're keeping them in check, but, but the longer we can lower the lake in the winter, the better, because the more we can freeze. Last year, we actually were pretty effective. And uh, so one of the things that, uh, that's really important is we're, we've been trying for three or four years to meet with the Corps of Engineers to have them be more flexible. So, and uh, actually, uh, it was something we discussed with Senator Gillibrand when she was here, and the meeting has been set up. So, and Anthony DeCaro will be coming with us, I hope. Um, but basically, we're looking for more flexibility so we can kill more of them. They, they really did contribute to huge blue-green algae blooms in 2010, 2011. Uh, but the next two years, we actually were able to kill more, and we didn't have those blooms. Luckily, those blooms happened in September after the bathing season, so they didn't have as much of an impact. Bruce, can you just explain the lake level, what we were trying to do with that oh. process? Yeah, uh, the, the, the lake level is controlled by the state dam. The Corps of Engineers has what they call a rule curve, and it's basically the guidance of what the city water department has to follow. So in the summer, it's at 713 is, is the target maximum. In the winter, 710, three feet lower, is the target minimum. And it's lower just to catch that sp spring snow melt and fill back up. But if we can actually get it down to 710 and keep it there for most of the winter, it'll kill more clams. And last year, we got down to 710.2 on a real cold snap really helped quite a bit. It is amazing because if you, I have samples in my office from the diving this summer. All the, um, once you're out in three feet of water and look deeper, there's, there are adult clams, but everything in the shallow water is just tiny stuff because all the adults were effectively killed. If we have a good winter and the core gives us a little more flexibility, we'll be able to kill, even getting it down another six inches might kill another 10 acres of the adults, and, and most of the adults are in shallow in the real pure sand off of Doville and off of the Pavilion Beach. So just getting it down a little bit more. Anthony's been very working very hard at it, uh, but the senator has helped set up a meeting and, and we hope to accomplish something with that. Now Bruce, do we, or Katie, do we have to, um, enforcement of, of regulations and so forth on the lake, I know we're, we're pretty low with manpower. Uh, I mean, I know you can do so much, and um, is that something that we are desperately in need? Well, Katie didn't say it, but what I would like is two or three Katies. Um, okay, now, explain why, though. I think the more... Two more Katies. Yeah, I think the more this? walking we're doing, the more interacting we're doing with 
with property owners. The more storm events we're actually having, have staff out watching some of the farm runoff, we could be more effective catching problems and working with the landowners to, to fix them. So right now, with Katie and like two or three summer inspectors, we're, we're sort of like 1.5 full-time equivalents. If we could gradually grow that to two to three full-time equivalent staff members, I think we would have more impact. And, it, so, and th there's been considerable development around the lake. Um, how does that concern you? Um, it, the thing that concerns me really about around the lake and, and, and what the summer inspectors are helping with is the more lawns, the more um, yard waste, the more pets, all that actually helps pollute the near shore, uh, the shallow areas. The shallow areas are where we're getting the clams, we're getting zebra mussels, we'll probably have quagga mussels soon, which is a bigger cousin of the zebra. Um, and when that happens, uh, you're setting up more chances for alg algae blooms. The algae blooms, uh, when the algae dies, that stuff gets into our drinking water plant, and that's when we have to use more carbon, uh, activated carbon to try and get that taste and that odor. You normally see in October and March, so it'll be coming soon. Uh, so the more we can do educating nearshore folks about how to manage yard waste, how to manage pet waste, just how to buffer their little piece of the lake and do their very best part to protect the lake. This is one of those things where everybody doing their little piece helps uh, the overall quality. And, and, and the way we can communicate that is having more people on the ground talking to people. Are we checking septic systems? Yes, yes. Actually, um, Cuga County has one of the best septic systems um, reinspection programs in the state. Um, ours is actually working so well. Eileen O'Connor has been invited to um, the, the statewide association of public uh, public health engineers for the state to actually explain how we do it because there's a, several other counties that are going to adopt our system. Folks who live on the lake who have septic systems have to have their systems tested every other year. Other parts of the state, you only get your system tested when the property sells. So if that property has been in the same family for two generations, it's probably never been tested. But in Cuga County, if you're lakefront, it's tested every other year. Bruce or Katie, whoever wants to field it, um, you mentioned the uh, algae. I know we have had some incidents with some of the blue-green algae. Um, can you comment on how that's being managed? Um, you know, I think the algae is, is the more we can do to cut down on phosphorus getting in the lake, the more we can educate lakeshore homeowners, the more that will improve. The more Asian clams we can kill in the winter, um, that will all help us. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's a matter sometimes of just weather conditions. Um, but um, I think overall, one of the best things, all the pressure we put to have the, the Groton sewage treatment plant upgraded several years ago. That has actually reduced a lot of soluble phosphorus from coming in the lake. The actual intensity of, of algae blooms in general has gone down, except for right over the clam beds. Uh, right, that's, that's actually, we discovered, the, we discovered the Asian clams because we were investigating the blue green algae uh, bloom, and, it, and they were in the same spot. So it was everything we can do to actually knock that population down every winter by lowering the lake as much as you can. That's, that's a big key, I think, for the next couple of years. Now this is the million dollar question. How do we handle calls when we lower the lake level of the people who live on the lake when they're camps? You know, one, one of the things that Frank DiOrio first and then, and then Anthony after that, it's, it's amazing. Um, he, he, I get the phone calls too, and, and you can actually get phone calls within the same week, people complaining that it's too high and people complaining that it's too low. Uh, people last year, when we were, had a dry August, were calling him saying, why are you letting water out? It's like, it hasn't rained in 45 days. Uh, <laughs> but we, we it, you know, it's just trying to explain to folks. And, and this year, we're running about, what, six, seven inches too deep right now, or over. 
Hugo Lake is eight, eight inches. I mean, it's just been a rainy summer. That, that's one of the toughest things I think Anthony has to deal with, and Vicki. <laughs> There's a couple of people out in the watershed that have all of our numbers, and they just call us, and Katie. But it's, it's just, you gotta explain the weather to them, you gotta explain, you know, we're letting out what we're allowed to let out, or it's just, that, that's a, that's a tr tricky one. I know. Bruce, who sets the level? Is it the Corps of Engineers? It is, um, it is following that rule curve the Corps of Engineers set up. And, and Anthony's done a fairly decent job of, of staying right, right on track with it, despite all the big storms we've had. We are the keeper of the lake. We are the keeper of the lake. In the but I, I would act, you know, Katie's done a good job. Jess, Jess did a nice job before her. Um, I, think, I think we're having a positive impact. Um, you know, if we had one and a half, two and a half KDs, I think we'd be doing better. You know, people often think because we're not giving um, a lot of penalties um, and that maybe our, some of our, our guidelines and our restrictions need to be updated. Uh, any, any validity to that? Um, I think that if I had any criticism from Katie, I, I think she, soon she needs to take out that violation book and start writing them. Oh no, I'm not looking for Christian Kate. I'm just saying do it. I'm just no, I'm just saying no. I think our rules are tough enough. I think if we actually really start cranking down and saying, okay, you gotta fix this or else you're you'll be brought in front of the Board of Health. And I think we do have a couple we have one or two cases of getting close to that point. Um, it's a public health violation, so if, if Katie writes up a violation then it'll go to the County Board of Health or actually it'll go to the County Board of Health that it's in. Um, so if it's in the Onondaga piece, it'll go to Onondaga's Board of Health. But we have a couple of cases actually working their way there. And Katie, not to put you on the spot, but uh, do you see some regulations that you'd like to see updated? Actually, yes, <laughs> I would. Mostly um, with uh, stormwater and maybe a, li a bit to do with agriculture, just to get things, you know, because the rules and regulations were written back in 1984, sometime in the 1980s. And so they should be, you know, looked at, but right now we're making it work and it, it is effective. Okay. And uh, uh, I'd like to underscore how much this ties hand in hand with the work we're doing at the state dam, how important that really is. And not only is it controlling a lake level, but it's also um, our first defense against flooding. Yep. And just to touch on the blue-green algae too, I just wanted to add quickly, um, the blue-green algae blooms, I mean, if they're gonna occur, they're gonna occur in you know, about September, about this time of year. And we do have a protocol for that. Um, if you are a lakefront resident or you're on Owasco Lake and you see something that resembles blue-green algae, what we have you do is take a sample. You can have a mason jar, a water bottle, anything like that. You can bring it to uh, my office or the health department and we can possibly send it to the state lab to get it confirmed as blue-green algae. So, and that is also on the website on the health department's website. Thank you. Thank you. Said council. Yep. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Bruce, thank you. Mm -hmm. Council, on, on the agenda I have in front of me, and I don't know if you have it or not, there's another presentation in regards to brownfields. Mm -hmm. I've been told by the city acting city manager that has been pulled for a later date, so. Shucks. We'll move along to public announcements. None. No. City, city manager's report. Um, just one item, Mayor. Um, city staff and our community partner agencies have been working to assist Cuga Community College in their efforts to uh, find temporary housing for students that were displaced in the Lattimore Hall fire. Um, so we'll continue our efforts till we learn uh, that the students are housed. Yeah, if I can comment on that, I spoke with, um, it's helping uh, some students uh, find some apartments. Uh, and I, I believe there was some water damage. Um, they couldn't get the sprinklers off, I guess. Um, the, um, in regards to Lattimore Hall, um, just to refresh my memory, the college is in control of that or is that, that it's is a, under? It's um, privately owned. It's, it is privately yes. owned. Could I interrupt one second? Uh, yeah. Dr. Larson's here. Uh, doctor, would you like to give us an update on, because um, I've been receiving emails from you and you've been on top of that situation. Thank you, John. Uh, 
there was a stove top fire on Monday afternoon. Uh, it was put out uh, quickly because the sprinkler system worked as it was designed to. Uh, it took place on the fifth floor, and so the water, of course, came down, and uh, there's uh, pretty extensive uh, water damage for uh, that side of the building. So there were uh, about 48 students who were uh, displaced Monday. Uh, they stayed at the Holiday Inn for three nights. College staff has worked uh, very closely with them. We have several students who are going to be housed for the fall semester at Wells College. Um, we have uh, worked with uh, a number of uh, people across uh, the city and the county to ensure that uh, every student will have a place to stay for the fall semester. And to add to that, there was uh, several landlords who came forward and offered apartments to these students uh, at a reduced rate mm -hmm. uh, and also provide furniture for them. Um, so it's, again, a tribute to the, the, the kind-heartedness of many of yes. our, our Bernians. Um, but no, they were pleased. Um, there were some parents that I did speak to. Um, and of course, some athletic coaches were concerned too with some of, of their players. Um, but, but they were pleased too with the uh, promptness and putting them in the Holiday Inn. Yes. So we believe that uh, every student will have his or her concerns addressed in a way that will be effective for them. Dan, thank you for your, um, and the staff at the college, of course, uh, quick response to this uh, problem that, that, that existed. Um, I know those students need to continue with their studies and they any do. interruption um, interrupts their lifestyle. So um, thank you for your, and I would like you to thank your staff also at the college for thank all they that. did. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Just one thing under city manager, if I could, please. Um, Doug is going to bring us some reorganization, and I'd like to remind him about we we're going to do something the 1st of September and start talking about reorganization and also on the budget. I'd like to have that brought back. And while we're on that subject, um, John, could you give us an update on, I see there's 28000 or almost $30,000 that was submitted under the claims list for um, Bon Shenick and King. Was that with the fire department litigation? $27,000 of that bill was labor negotiations with the fire department okay and i have a copy of the bill if you'd like yeah i'd like to get a, i'd like to see where, what exactly was spent in that area and also if doug could bring us um give us an update on the um overtime with the fire department since uh september 1st i guess was when the layoffs went in effect so thank you we'll get that john you're all set on the manager's report yes thank you thank you Presentation, petition, communications. Excuse me. No. Seeker resolution number 104 of 2013 regarding the Schwartz Family Performing Arts Center. Because this was table, we'll need a sponsor and a, and a second to bring it back on the floor. We have a sponsor. Councilor Graney, seconded by Councilor Smith. Mr. Rossi, do we read, need to reread the entire document back into the record? No, it's, it's been rec read and it's been open for uh, inspection and uh, the tabling uh, does not affect that part of it and we don't have to read it all over again. Very good, thank you. In regards to the, uh, the record that's attached here, uh, I looked through this, what we were given last and distributed in our pa package and uh, I found myself in agreements with the, the law firm here, uh, mislabeling, there's, in fact, there's no labeling. I know, Councilor Graney, you have it. Find me, uh, find me, uh, uh, Councilor, find me disc P. Which, which, disc, which document are you? I'm talking about the secret document and the record attached. Find me the P, find me exhibit P. You got 20 seconds. Yeah. 20 seconds. <laughs> Give me a hint, Pete. Oh, I'm, I'm just trying to make it. Okay, Councilor Smith. Page 15. No. Two, two. It's in the back, way in the back, and these are all out of order. Okay, Councilor Smith, I want you to find me uh, Exhibit B. Exhibit B? B. B is in victory. You notice he's got to paw through this. There's no labels. 
And there's a myriad of documents. These are not in order. This record is atrocious. I recommend that until this record is completed and, and put in order and made reasonably correct, in fact, it's missing pages. Uh, uh, the affidavit of Yvonne is missing. Uh, if you look at the part two, it's missing every other page in the document. This record is terrible. So how can we vote on a, on a resolution with a record like this? You don't vote on a resolution and fix the record. The record has to be in place before the vote happens. So I recommend this be tabled for another week until this record gets corrected. Councilor, is that a, a motion? Yes. To table? To fix the, correct the record. If we don't correct the record and we vote on this record, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, it's borderline fraud. Councilor, if I may, uh, it's a motion to table and yes. to, correct, to, to, the record. to correct the record. Give them a week. May I, I'm Council. sorry, Councilor, can you just explain a little bit more what you mean by that? The record is attached here. If you look at it, the, in the resolution, it's referring to lettered and lettered sections of the record. This record is part of this resolution. This record is incomplete, totally messed, missing pages, mislabeled. Just for the fact, you couldn't find any of those exhibits. We don't vote on a record and then correct it afterwards. That's not correct. That's not procedurally correct. The record needs to be fixed. So you're asking for it to be more? I'm asking for it to be put off for another week until this record gets fixed. Put in order, labeled. In, uh, in fact, there's some documents that are added to different records. As I pawed through this thing, I spent several hours this weekend. And uh, I didn't change the order of it. I made new copies of it and put it in order at my house in order to understand what he was trying to say here and found that there was a, several pages missing. If you look in the part two, every other page is missing. We go from page. Right here. We're skipping page one, page three. Page two or two, then we go up to here to one. I mean, it's all over the map. <clears throat> the record needs to be repaired. It's right here in a secret document, or right here in the resolution. It refers to all these documents in the record. In fact, they start on page three and four. The record is insufficient. My copy of the record is in order. I you, do know you made a uh, that Anna. Oh, I made a motion that we. Is there a second? Yeah. Uh, well, so second. Mr. Graney asked me to come up. But there's there's a, there's a motion. I'm sorry. The floor. There wasn't a second yet. I I don't know. Did did you ask? Did you ask? Yes, I asked. I asked that the record be a, a motion and right. clarification. So, uh, I. I I'd rather get some clarification. I want clarification. I, I want clarification before I ask for it. Does anyone want a second at this time, or would you rather hear clarification? I like to hear the clarification. Please. I don't know if I have a clarification. I know I know that uh, Mr. Selby's secretary Anna made the copies uh, last week, last uh, f uh, Friday, um, so that you'd have them in your packets for this week. Um, I know she had some trouble with that because she told me so. Uh, I d personally didn't stand at the copy machine and, um, and make the copies. I know that the copy that I have, which is intended for publication uh, tomorrow in Albany, is in order. There's no tabs yet for the simple reason that additional, I expected that additional uh, documents would be submitted tonight and in fact they were. Uh, so uh, they'll, they'll be, everything will be tabbed uh, once we have the, once we have the final, uh, uh, we, once we have the final, uh, 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 all of the final documents. But by adjourning for another week, all you're going to get is another set of documents next week. And so, well, let's, the record let's wait another week, and they'll get, then you get another set of documents the week after. I mean, this is now the third time we've been here, and as we can see, documents are submitted every single time that 
during the public to be heard portion when, so it's, it's, it's almost virtually impossible for me to know what is going to be submitted when it isn't submitted ahead of time. Uh, the, the, the members of the Camargo Law Firm who were here tonight don't share with me the, what they're going to do ahead of time. They hand it up in the public to be heard. Uh, last week we did make some additions, uh, uh, but this week the, the secretaries didn't work overtime. They had to work till 10 o'clock last week, uh, trying to, 10 o'clock at night, realizing that Mr. Camargo's uh, partners would be, or associates, would be submitting documents at the last minute. So the copy that I have is complete. If, if uh, uh, Mr. Selby's secretary made a mistake, accept my apology for that. Andy, that's the record we have to look at in order to make a judgment. Also, I noticed that there's no phase one documentation in this record. You got, you, you got the part one tab. Part one tabbed. have the phase one in it. There is no phase one documents in that. Well, that was not, that might not have been part of the previous seeker. I'm not certain of that. I, that I'm not certain. I, I, I don't know verbatim what's in part one. I do know parts two and three. I, in here, there should be the phase one documents which triggered everything and started here. That was the whole idea that, in fact, it's referred, phase one is referred to in many letters from Ms. Marsh and other uh, people making communications and we don't even have it. I never even seen it. So therefore, like I say, I maintain the record is incomplete. We can't vote on it tonight until it gets at least put in order, put in front of us. And if there's any additions, we get them that night, we see them, we know that where they go. So that being said, I'm asking for to move the motion. I made a motion that we table them until the record gets cleared. Very good. Is there a second? Hearing no second, defeated. <coughs> Mr. Fusco, you want to take over where we left off last week? Yes. Yeah, so excuse me one second. Councilor Smith, did you want to weigh in at this point or did you want to hold off? You, you, want, you yes, wanted to are talk we about, talking about the seeker. The seeker. Yes, we are. I did go through this, and it's um, table of contents would have been nice, um, but that's beside the point. Going through this um, reading, um, as always, my main concern has been the fire issue. And I did read um, a couple of the documents um, on the fire issue here. Uh, and we had Mr. Tanner. The county code enforcement, he came and presented. Uh, Mr. Hicks, our senior code enforcement officer uh, from the city hall, from Auburn City Hall. And of course, um, Mr. Diger, uh, Chief Diger, excuse me, from the Auburn Fire Department. And I just want confirmation. Now, I'm, I'm not a fire chief, I'm not a code enforcement officer. Um, I, these are not my areas of expertise. And Quite often, you, you try to research as much as you possibly can when it comes to issues like this. Uh, and with the God-given abilities that, that I have, that we have, you use them to the best of your ability. Um, and with many issues, I, I talk to experts that are in this area, um, that work in this field, that are outside of the, um, outside of the, the scope of, of operations, if you will. They really have no ties to, to Auburn, to the project, um, to either side of the issues. And I do that with many, many issues. Um, to the, um, to, now going back to the point um, about the uh, fire apparatus, and as I said, this has always been a concern. Um, and forgive me for, for reading to you. I think everyone that's come the last three weeks, uh, we've been read to quite a bit in here. Um, but uh, I, I won't take long. Uh, the theater includes protection and safety features such as the automatic sprinkler system, um, audible smoke and fire alarms, panic devices for egress doors, uh, fire rated construction at exterior walls, smoke vents over the stage. Uh, as we discussed, the fire apparatus road cannot be installed because of the location of the building on the property. Uh, the topography and the non-negotiable grades and other similar conditions, such as the configuration of State Street, which is not under the control of the college or county. Because a fire apparatus road cannot be installed for this building, we investigated alternative means 
of fire protection as permitted by the code. Uh, I want to come back to that point. Now, attached for your consideration and approval are sketches showing how the front stair could be extended to the roof and can be equipped with a standpipe. Um, now, I won't go on anymore. Um, and then other documents kind of reads that we have in here talk about the same thing. Um, the building is equipped with automatic sprinkler, block and steel construction, fire rated interior finishes. Um, on April 15th at 11.30 a.m., the Auburn Fire Department practiced setting up engine number five on State Street uh, in front of the proposed theater site. All the parking spaces were full on both sides of the street and it was set up without an issue. This is a 55-foot aerial truck. So, my concern, of course, is the, is the safety of, of any individuals that are within this building in the case that there was a fire. Um, and really, I know these, these, air, these sections of the city are grandfathered. If you look at Court Street, we could have a similar problem because the, I believe that street's pretty small. Um, and and it, it's, a, it's a similar type situation. So to have confirmation, all right, Chief Diger, Mr. Tanner, and Mr. Hicks, all three of you believe that, this, that, this, that the changes that have been made, the adaptions that we have made to these buildings, um, individuals who are at, at the theater, uh, and God forbid if there was an accident, um, we are, they are safe um, as much as possibly a person can be safe. Uh, they can be rescued um, in the event of a fire. Simple answer is yes. Uh, Mr. Tanner, and Mr. Hicks, and myself have worked for, especially Mr. Tanner and myself, have worked for about two years on this project and seen it develop through different phases. We've gone through the effort to make sure that we can set up our aerial devices, not only the fire engines with aerial devices on them, but our actual ladder trucks, which have a wider jack spread. And at one point, we, we provided you folks with uh, some photos of that. I've got other copies of that. It's tight, but as you have mentioned, uh, Court Street's a similar circumstance, School Street's a similar circumstance. We're dealing with an existing infrastructure of streets and buildings that uh, without having some allowances and, and, to, and allowing those things, we'd have an awful lot of vacant spots in the city if we couldn't uh, utilize different methods, new technologies. The code allows for that. The code is flexible to some extent to allow for changes in technology, changes in building design, things like that. And we have um, four to five hydrants within, was it 100 feet? I've easily got three within, the, within a block of that, other than a half a block of that. There's one right across the street and uh, one at each end of State Street. Water supply is not an issue, never has been. Okay, can you explain for me one more time the, uh, the, the standpipe? Okay, what a standpipe is essentially is a solid piece of pipe with valves on it that goes from the street level all the way, in this instance, all the way to the roof. So that rather than a firefighter, in, you know, if you envision a 20-story building, rather than trying to drag a hose line filled with water up 20 flights of stairs okay. that you can just go to a connection on the affected floor actually the floor below is where we hook up but we can actually hook up to that standpipe at that point and utilize a shorter length of hose what we have is basically 150 foot inch and a half diameter hoses actually inch and three quarter diameter hoses that allow those firefighters to make an attack on the fire without having to go through the trouble of dragging the hose up the outside of the building or going the entirely up the staircase. And again, forgive me for my ignorance in this. Is there a chance that that standpipe in the event of, of a fire uh, or something happened in the building could um, um, be prohibited from working? There's very little mechanical okay. involved, especially with a building that short. If I was to get into a building in excess of 10 stories tall, those those systems would have auxiliary uh, fire pumps in them. They'd have pressure relief devices. In a building of that, that height, because there's not a significant amount of head pressure or 
water weight on the system, we don't need anything like that. It's a very simple system. Chief, I got a question. Now, the building was redesigned to uh, accommodate the standpipe, and there's a, a stairwell? Correct. Uh, dedicated just for emergency. I, I, if I remember correctly, it's been, uh, it's been roughly, it's been two years now, and the building's gone through some changes in its footprint and all of those things. Uh, originally, if I recall, there was not a protected staircase in the building. It wouldn't be required typically in a building like that, uh, of that very modest two-story height. I mean, it's really not that big of a deal by all accounts. Um, but what they added into the design of the building as an extra added fire safety feature is an enclosed fire rated stairwell. So the fire service can utilize that stairwell, not be encumbered by occupants egressing the building in a fire situation, hook up to their standpipe and make access to not only the first floor, the second floor, but as well the roof, which is again, not it's very uncommon for a building that's only two stories tall to have a design feature like that. That would be more typical with a high rise building outside or beyond the reach of an aerial device. So you feel they went beyond in their design it, yes. for safety yes. features? Okay. Now, if we wanted to down the road here, and this is something that we have obviously the option to do, if we wanted to make it where you could only park on one side of the street, that would be, I mean, you're comfortable the way it is now with the parking situation is, but if we just made it on one side of the street, that would be that much easier for, for you guys. Uh, without looking back at my notes, I believe structurally, curb to curb, that street is 31 and a half feet wide, roughly. So it's well within the 26 foot dimension. Um, there's about 10 feet taken off each side for the parking spots based on its original design or the way it's striped right at the moment. So yes, uh, it is within the code enforcement's authority and the fire chief's authority to, to actually limit parking on a street if we want to, if we feel it's a fire safety issue. So we could do that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we've been discussing this for a long time and uh, for, for a couple of years and um, Mr. Rizika is with, with just about every issue. He's very thorough in, in, in how he looks at, at everything, and, and, and I respect that. Um, what I don't want is a hole in the ground on State Street. And the things, I guess we have to look at what, um, and I know there's disagreement on this council on this, um, but what we have to look at is what do we have to do as a city and what are we responsible for? Now, as far as the college finances go, I don't know the college finances. Um, that's between the finances of the city, that's enough for me to be concerned with. And that's, that's my scope of responsibility, and, and that's where I have to focus in on my attention. Uh, that's for the Board of Trustees, that's for the college presidents, the college faculty, the union, and so forth. They, they have to deal with those issues. Um, my concern years ago was uh, I wanted to go with the lawn form originally. I wanted to go at a slower place, pace, excuse me, so we wouldn't have to be at this, um, at this stage. Um, as I said back then, as I say now, we want a successful project here. Um, we want a successful project because we want Auburn to be successful. And it is something new and it's something unique to the city of Auburn. Um, but before I go any further, I, I do take exception with something that was said last week um, on city investment. Um, I, I believe, in, in all due respect to, to Mr. Souls, who, who has um, invested in this community, and, and I'm all for individuals who invest in this community. Goodness gracious, we, we want, there's nothing wrong with making. Um, I'm, I'm signaling to the chief to sit yeah, down. It, there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with people making a profit. Uh, profit's a, a bad word these days, unfortunately. Uh, if people don't make profits, people don't have jobs, they don't stay in business. Um, and, and, and I have no problems with that. But to say that the city has invested very little into this project or very little into downtown is, 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 is really a, um, um, it's, it's a tale. It's, a, it's, it's not the truth. Um, and just to give you a little background, 
Um, $1.3 million the city's invested um, for streetscape improvements, all right, and that, that's including the complete renovation of Exchange Street Mall. Um, and this is money that we applied for, money that we looked for to get for our downtown. Uh, close to a million dollars for rehab of the Market Street Park. Uh, $50,000 for reconstruction of seminary. Uh, $400,000 for demolition of the Callet Building. Plus, on top of that, you're looking at another over $200,000 that we gave away for tipping fees. All right, so you're looking at you know 700, almost 800 thousand dollars there, which that was no grant money that came from the city. Uh, 700 thousand dollars for reconstruction of the first block of State Street, and again that goes back to before I was on council in 2004. And then you look at the role of pilots, uh, the role that pilots have played. Um, in the taxable value change from 2012 to 2013, uh, there's an exemption increase of, of $5,017,000 uh, in pilots. So again, that, that, that's $5 million in appraised value that's taking off the tax rolls for pilots. So my point in bringing this up is that the city, the taxpayers, the, the city council, uh, our planning staff, we have taken a very serious look at our downtown to make downtown um, much more impressive than what it's been uh, the past 20 years, that's for sure. And, and I think we're seeing the fruits of our labor. Um, I believe that the theater will add to that. Uh, and I, I do not want to uh, impede this, um, uh, impede the progress of this uh, of this project. My main concern was the safety, the fire safety, and number two, and we need to make this clear: city tax dollars are not being spent tonight. We're approving a seeker. All right, Auburn tax dollars are not going into. Um, the further construction of this project. Mr. Fusco, you can attest to that, correct? That we are not paying, Jenny, um, it, it's, and Mr. Selby would be saying the same thing. This is going on to the county, uh, the, the, the college, this is on, excuse me, this will be put on their lap, um, but city tax dollars will not be, uh, will not go towards the construction of this project. Andy, can you um, inform the public why this came back to us? Yes, but before I do that, as long as the chief is still here, in his remarks he did refer to some photographs and I asked him to bring copies for all members of council uh, and uh, for the, uh, the clerk as well. <clears throat> Mr. Graney has asked me why has this matter come back to us? And the answer, the short answer for the members of the public is that uh, two courts ordered it. Uh, originally, we were the lead agency uh, because we had the duty of, uh, of uh, tearing down the Callet building and then conveying the land which we owned uh, because the former owners didn't pay tax conveying the land to the, uh, to the county of Cayuga. Uh, the, in the litigation that was taken to the fourth department appeals court, <clears throat> there were about 17 or 18 r issues raised. Uh, and we were successful in all of those except one. The court construed that what we did in February of 2011 was set a condition that the vapors that were detected in the various testing that was done uh, just before and just after or just during demolition, uh, that we were requiring the builder, the colleges, uh, the college, uh, to vent those vapors uh, through a device that is now called for uh, in this particular, in this particular uh, document that you have before you, the seeker part three, the environmental assessment form part three. By the time 
that matter was heard by the appellate division court in Rochester, the two items which we were required to do, namely demolish the existing Callet building and sell the land to the county, had been completed. And there's a tenant in law that says that an agency, you're an agency, that no longer has an involvement, no longer has a role in the in, in a project cannot be lead agency. And there happens to be a case right on point from our own fourth department court, uh, K, uh, the court it's called uh, Mulligan versus Cooperstown Field of Dreams. So as the members of this council know, because I briefed you on this um, in executive session about a year ago, I was in a legal quandary as to a darned if you do, darned if you don't situation. Uh, and because we no longer had an involvement in the, uh, in the project, uh, I felt that we were on potentially shaky ground by going forward as the lead agency. For that reason, the college performed their own seeker review last fall. And when the college completed its review and came up with an unconditional negative declaration, that matter was challenged in court as well. And the court, the second court, which was Supreme Court, Judge Polito, at that particular time ordered us to specifically do this. It said that, uh, that the, our, our opponents in this case would have in effect be uh, equitably stopped from asserting the fact that uh, we no longer had an involvement. So we were ordered, literally ordered to do this by, by two courts uh, so that maybe we don't want to do it, but we have to do it. Uh, maybe, and I respect Mr. Rizika's thoroughness as well, maybe Mr. Rizika would want to see a positive declaration or maybe perhaps he'd want to see an unconditional negative declaration. I don't know. But the course of order is that we don't have that choice. Typically when you do a seeker review, you have three choices. An unconditional negative declaration, a positive declaration, or a conditioned negative declaration. That's usually the three choices that are before you. In this particular case, we don't have those three choices. The courts have said there will not be a positive declaration. There will not be an environmental impact statement. Judge Polito specifically said that. And the appellate division specifically said there will be a conditioned negative declaration. It was remanded back to us to issue a conditioned negative declaration. So while the, the, the research by Pete is, is impressive to say the least, while the arguments of Mr. Huffman and Mr. Cox are cogent legal arguments, we are not in a position to do anything other than the courts have ordered us to do, which is to issue a conditioned negative declaration, hence the proposed resolution which you have before you that Mr. Rizika has uh, made the motion on and Mr. Graney has made the second. Okay, I, I would like to address some public safety issues along the same line. I have some documents here that I'm going to pass out. This is for you. There's one for the mayor and for the record. Um, and uh, since, the same. Yeah, since Mr. Uh, Camaro is just an observer, I got him a copy as well. <coughs> and uh, I'm going to go over these oh. in detail. <clears throat> now I, I'm going to put in a drive so that everybody can see the same documents out here in the, in the audience.
These are documents selected from the uh, full EI uh, environmental assessment form, uh, otherwise known as the FEAF. This here is page uh, of the document here, it's found in tab 23. Uh, it may be a little difficult to read, but underneath it says, uh, 10 inch holes punched in the concrete slab to facilitate percolation of water may have allowed venting of volatile compounds from below the slab, which would cause results of the SVI, soil vapor intrusion testing or sampling to be biased low. So in this thing here, you, you look at it, there's a potentially screwed up test here. Okay, if we go down to below where I have it also highlighted, it says several chlorinated VOCs, including 1,1 tetrachlorethene, 1,2 dichlorethylene, carbon tetrachloride, tetrachlorethene, trichloroethylene, dichloroethylene, are commonly used or with the, associated with the degreasing or dry cleaning operations or are byproducts of degradation of parent materials and their presence in sub-slab samples may be attributed to proximal spills, recent or historic. And then you go underneath here and then you got the DO, uh, Department of Health uh, 2006 guidance. And it talks about these VOCs. Okay, and the, it talks about the decision matrix and we're gonna get to that later. The decision matrix, and it says where I've got a highlight, for carbon tetrachloride, the matrix indicates that monitoring should be implemented as an interim measure to determine whether further action is necessary. And then also if I go down here, it says New York State Department of Health, October 26, 2006 guidance based on these conditions and the fact that many VOCs beyond the four compounds used in the decision-making matrices were detected in the sub-slab soil vapor samples, more conservative actions may be applicable for those than drive through the strict interpretation of the guidance. And it says the most common mitigation methods are sealing preferential plat pathways or, and it, go, it goes into talking about installing a vapor barrier. Now this, we're talking about a full site here. So now I go to a, the next document on tab 22, where it talks in possible historic leaching of cleaning solutions spilled during the time the building was used to store, clean, and repair furs. This adds to part, to phase one investigations. Then, of course, if you look at under A, A under uh, conclusions and recommendations, this is based on AEC's understanding that the concrete slab will be left in place and a new structure will be constructed for use on the property. Let's look at some selected pages from the final guidance that, that appears that we're taking this a la carte. It says, a thorough understanding of the site, including its contamination, or including its history of use, characteristics, e.g. geology, geography, identified environmental contamination, et cetera. It's talking about the entire site. Then we go, it says, when determining what actions, if any, are appropriate to mitigate current or pre prevent future human exposures and all information known about the site is considered, i.e. a whole picture approach is taken because each site presents its own unique set of characteristics. Again, we go here to under 2.1. The likely substance, subsurface source, e.g. on basis of known previous land uses of volatile chem chemicals. Okay, it's talking about what's in the ground here. Then it talks if groundwater is contaminated and a building is uh, uh, sustained to leakage. I know they claim this is building is sealed, but over time these seals break. Foundations crack, walls crack, everyone knows new construction su suspect of cracks. It says, if locations of the likely source areas are reasonably known, sampling during the investigation of the site rather than later is recommended because of the iterative nature of the sampling process. It says, in the latter scenario, groundwater and soil and other site information may be used as guide of an investigation of soil vapor intrusion pathways, such selecting zones and locations for subsurface vapor samples based on likely mitigation pathways and source areas. And this is in section 2.61 and 2.62. At a minimum depth, groundwater and soil stochography should be identified prior to use. And then it also goes down here, if exposures due to soil vapor intrusion appear likely, delay of sampling is contemplating, i.e. the state, i.e. New York State Department of Health and DEC should be informed of the contemplated delay and the rational, rationale for the delay. I don't think we've ever d done anything here. Now we look at the decision matrix. Now the decision matrix, remember we had a screwed up test here. 
We had to levels that are indeterminate because of the, the holes punched into slabs and water used to flush the area. It says, and underneath this thing it says, take reasonable practical actions to identify sources and reduce exposures. It says, therefore, steps should be taken to identify potential sources and reduce exposures accordingly by keeping, uh, and it talks about containers. Resampling may be recommended to demonstrate the effectiveness of actions taken to reduce exposures. And then it talks about monitoring and get, mitigate. It says monitoring or mitigation may be re recommended after considering the magnitude of subsoil vapor in indoor air concentrations. Well, we had indoor air concentrations that were skewed because all the windows were knocked out of the building. We had in, uh, subsoil or subslab vapor concentrations that were skewed because we had holes punched in the floor. On the bottom here, if exposure requires a concern due to outdoor sources, then the DEC will decide who is responsible for further investigation and any necessary remediation. Depending on the outdoor, outdoor source, this responsibility may or may not fall upon the party conducting the so soil vapor intrusion. Then I go on here. Community outreach. No one even heard of any of this soil vapor intrusion testing or anything until this secret hit. It says a heightened awareness by environmental professionals and general public, both nationally and statewide, for the importance of soil vapor intrusion. It says while people may have been exposed to contamination, providing them with accurate and timely information about these exposures is extremely important. This information should include the details about the types of chemicals, the levels of exposure, and possible health risks from those exposures. Understand these chemicals cause cancer. In addition, information should be include details about the planning process of the investigation and remediation efforts. This says techniques commonly used to inform the public about soil vapor intrusion issues are described in this section. The types and types of techniques selected for the site will vary depending on the community's needs, site-specific conditions, and remedial program. And then it talks about contact list. Site contains list contains contacts, addresses, telephone numbers. That was never done. Project staff contact sheet was never done. Then we go down here to your CES report. Certified Environmental Services, CES, continues to be recognized as an approved laboratory under New York State Department of Health's Environmental Laboratory Approval Program. It says, given this in reference, it suggests that there are compounds present in the soil and installation of a vapor barrier and subsled depressurization system within new building does not completely address the four other concerns originally raised by CES's August 31st, 2012 letter. CES believes that additional environmental work on site should be completed prior to construction in an effort to determine if the potential adjacent adverse environment impact may require mitigation. It is worth noting that according to Appendix A of the E or the FEAF 1,600 cubic yards a 1,600 cubic yard of soil is, are slated to be removed as part of the basement excavation portions of which may be within the groundwater table. Sampling and analysis of the site's groundwater and soil would deem, seem prudent in an attempt to determine whether the potential exists for any current environmental concerns to create adverse release to the air during construction which would impact site workers, continuous, big, continuous big building occupants, general public, groundwater by dewatering activities in, during construction, continued mitigation of can, contaminants within the groundwater that may exist. And then we go down here, though the most common mitigation methods are sealing pre preferential pathways or installing a vapor barrier in conjunction with the installation of a subslab pressurization depre de depressurization system. Here too, CES would agree that this approach is typically the most common measure to address concerns related to subslab vapors. However, it's typically used in instances where there is existing buildings on site with well-known soil and or groundwater contaminations, which may be inaccessible for, or for sites which soil and groundwater remediation has occurred and is generally used as a precautionary measure to protect occupants either of either current or future buildings. However, important to note in this case, it has yet to be determined whether or not the soil or groundwater contamination in even exists. Soil and groundwater and the analytical data would seemingly be necessary to ensure that these concentration activities are performed in a manner to offer protection to the human health for both workers and the public. Provide protection to the environment by determining proper material transportation and disposal options and avoid creating possible pathways for contamination, if any, to migrate into confining layers via pathways created during construction. Since it appears that the form of building itself included a basement slab that has already been removed from the site, at accessing the subsurface soil under groundwater for sampling and analysis would be relatively simple. 
And then it also says it should be also noted that other contaminants such as heavy trace metals and semi-volatile organic compounds, which also be considered are, are typical in urban environments. It says in closing, AEC indicated in their February 17th report that detected VOCs in the vapor could possibly be historic leaching and cleaning fluids solutions spilled during the time the building was used to store, clean, and, and repair furs, which seemed indicative that the source for such vapors could be the site itself. And in order to best determine the site's soil or groundwater source as a source of concern, sampling and analysis at this time would not only seem logical, but prudent. Okay, now we go back through here, and then we had a discussion between uh, Wendy Marsh and a judge. And I only read a uh, abbreviated portion of it since it's, it's not that long, but the court, and wasn't sampling taken of the soil? Ms. Marsh, no. The court, that's what they're trying to get at. What's in the soil in terms of contaminants? Ms. Marsh, that's what the petitioners would like us to do. The court, that's what everybody wants to get at to make sure there's no problem with the soil. Now, I didn't read the entire passage. These are the only things that I feel are really drive the point. Now let's look at the other side of the coin here. If testing is done in the groundwater and in the uh, soil, and it finds insignificant levels of the VOCs, then the project won't have to add the cost of this mitigation method, no construction of the sub-SAB system, and it will save the project a bunch of money. Now I'm gonna ask each one of the council members during the vote to tell me why or why not they do not feel that this groundwater and uh, vapor, or ground water and, and soil sample needs to be taken. I feel it's a very important and very critical for this. What it is, is it's not saying no to Secra, it's adding a condition. It's not saying no to the project, it's adding a condition to a conditional negative declaration. <clears throat> now, now let's talk fire safety. And here I got chapter five, section 502 titled definitions. I got chapter five, section 503 titled fire apparatus access roads, where required, 5.3, 503.1, building and facilities, 503.2 specifications, 503.2.1 dimensions. Then I have appendix D, section D 105 titled aerial fire apparatus access roads in, se in subsection D 105. 105.1 where required and D105.2 width. Here we can read if we the fire code it says fire uh, under 5021 in the definitions. Fire apparatus access road, a road that provides the apparatus access from a fire station to a facility, building or portion thereof. This is a general term inclusive of all terms such as fire lanes, public street, pub, private street, parking lot and roadway. Now we go to 503.1.1 building and facilities. Approved fire access roads shall be provided for every facility, building, or portions of building hereafter constructed or moving, moved it within the jurisdiction. The fire access road shall comply with the requirements of this section and shall extend to within 150 feet of all portions of, its fills of the facility and all portions of the exterior walls of the first story of the building as measured by an approved route around the exterior of the building. Exceptions, the distance is permitted to be 300 feet where the building is equipped with a, with a uh, thorough or equipped throughout with an automatic with an approved automatic sprinkler system installed in accordance with 903.3.1.1 or 903.1.2 when approved by city code officials. Now I can understand that a fire apparatus road cannot be installed because of location on property or topography waterways, non-negotiable grades, or other similar conditions is equipped with an automatic sprinkler system in accordance with 903.3.1. Point one, and approved alternate means of fire protection is provided. However, if you go down to 503.2, which says fire apparatus ac access shows shall be installed in a range in accordance with sections 503.21 through 503.27 and Appendix D. It continues on except for approved security gates in accordance with section of 503.6 and unobstructed vehicle clearance of not less than 13 feet, six inches. Fire apparatus road shall be also meet the, with requirements of sections D103.1 and D105 of appendix D. Now, nowhere in this code 
does it talk about building height except in Appendix D. The trigger here in Appendix D where there's no exemption, fire apparatus, section D105, aerial fire apparatus access roads, where required, buildings or portion of buildings or facilities exceeding 30 feet in height above the lowest level of the fire department vehicle access shall be provided with approved fire apparatus roads capable of accommodating fire department aerial apparatus. Overhead utility power lines shall not be located within the aerial fire apparatus width uh, roadway the, in D105.2. The width, width the fire apparatus access road shall have a minimum un unex unobstructed width of 26 feet in the immediate vicinity of any building of or portion of building more than 30 feet in height. The trigger here is now it becomes not a fire apparatus access road but an aerial apparatus access road. Now, the big excuse is the city doesn't have any control or the developer doesn't have control of the street. Well, this is a map from the plans that were given to us a couple weeks ago in a letter that shows the street is being touched. They're building a, a, a crane pad. The, seat, the street's being fenced off. The pavement's being cut. Under sub, sub, uh, subterranean uh, uh, utilities are being removed. These are all features that are being done under the street. These are, now I'm gonna talk about their, their field test analysis. And, and this is three pages from the field test, a description of fire apparatus, sketch of fire apparatus envelope, a sketch of entrance of State Street at the intersection of, with Genesee, photos taken by Auburn Fire Department during field testing, and then a, there's a CAD recommending uh, rendering of the fire apparatus turning the radius as it goes into the street. There's the description of the fire truck. The curb to curb turning radius of the American La France rear mount 100 foot ladder tower ladder unit tower unit with a standard front suspension and other same components wheels tires wheelbase front bumper extension would be 39.48 feet with a wall to wall not including platform or overhang of 42.81 actual measurements as follows middle of front axle to front of bucket 12 feet ground to bottom of bucket 93 or 93 inches or 70, 7 foot 9 inches with the bucket 9 feet. With the vehicle on outside dimensions mirror to mirror 9 feet 7 inches. W height of vehicle 11 feet 10 inches. Wheelbase center front axle to rear axle 22 <coughs> feet 6 inches. Wheelbase center of front axle to center of front rear axle 19 feet 10 inches. Full length of vehicle 41 feet. Here's their sketch of the outrigging, and then you can see that it takes 15, 19 feet to outrig this. There's the sketch given of, of the street. You can see that with the parking lanes of 10 feet, you only got 11 feet, 8 inches of, of clearance. The following photos were taken on 418, 213 by the uh, Auburn Fire Department for the field test. This is that ladder truck coming down the street. You've got a guy guiding the thing down the street so it doesn't hit any cars. Here you got it starting to outrig. They're, they're, they guided it down and cherry picked the location so it could clear that car. Here you can see how close it is to that car. If they're coming in in a hurry, how are they going to do that? Here it is outrigged. It's it, intruding right into the parking place of the car. Here it is a close up of it intruding in the car. And notice it's a compact car. Here is it fully outrigged in the street. Here it is full, on the other end, outrigged in the street. You can see it in the dimensions here where it's close to the other side of the cars and, and inside the parking area. Here it is, the compact car. If it was a, if it was a full size car or a long pickup truck, this couldn't happen. There it is, it's a, very near the bumper. Here's the, the same condition here with the, the truck shown a little closer, how it, it, it's over the, it's inside the uh, part, well inside the parking on the, uh, would be the east side. Here is another shot of it on the other side where it's very near the parked cars. Here's a close up. Here it is outrigged again. You can see again there was a compact car in position. Again, it's well in the parking area. There it is as a close up. Now the door access. Look, how the doors are barely open, can be opened here. This has to be cherry picked in location in order to do this. There you got maybe an inch or two of clearance there. Now here's a CAD rendering using the Ackerman steering principle which we use in our, our uh, businesses to determine mobility of, of uh, military vehicles when burdened with, with expeditionary radar equipment. 
You could see that the street has to, that truck has to swing, and this is the theoretical tightest turn this truck can make. The dry guy, driver drives up to the sweet spot, turns the wheels to the lock, and turns in and makes the approach. You can see here that he needs to have 36 feet from the entrance of that road. That puts it very near, or if not, into the lane on the eastbound side. If that is congested with traffic or backed up with traffic, this truck can't make that turn. They also, if you look at it too, now the uh, yellow areas is where it's outrigged, and you can see it's well in the parked area, even if the truck was centered. This, this is not an acceptable condition, and it obviously can be corrected. The, the developer needs to make, the, the city taxpayers can't pay for this. It's up to the developer who has control of the street during construction, as I showed, to reconfigure the street and make it comply with fire codes, and uh, especially the section Appendix D. So I'll continue. The trigger for this is the 38 8 height building. Nowhere in the previous section or the exclusions does it talk about height. Height does not enter into the equation until it becomes the trigger for an aerial apparatus road. This road does not conform with those specifications and needs to be repaired. Mayor, I see Mr. Tanner's here. Can you uh, comment on this, Mr. Tanner? I know you elaborated fully two weeks ago on this. And, and before you talk, Mr. Tanner, how long have you been doing code enforcement? Uh, two and a half, three years. What, what level of training have you got? All of the official certification. Which is what? As well as the zoning officer, IT <coughs> certification. <coughs> and just about every other construction certification you could ask for. So you've only been doing this two years. How many fire inspections have you done? I do 65 a year for the county, about uh, 72 in Senate. Um, Union Springs, I do about 15. Um, probably more than most code enforcement officers do in 10 or 15 years. What about, and now, how many have you done in the city? In the city of Auburn, I do all of the municipal buildings twice a year. Now, what, I'm talking more about new construction. Fire inspections? Yes. You don't actually do a fire inspection. For what about code compliance for fire access roads and aerial apparatus roads? What was the question? What about insurement of the, uh, fulfilling the requirements of fire apparatus roads and aerial apparatus roads? That's all done during code compliance. What I'm saying is this doesn't, this needs to be identified as a, as a potential safety issue now and be targeted for investigation by codes and planning. Councilor Green, you have the floor, sir. You have, you have questions, please. Comment on Appendix D. Um, first of all, I'd like to comment on a few things. Sure. Um, a fire apparatus road is what the code says. It starts when the fire truck leaves the fire department. Um, along the way, there are actually a lot of things code enforcement officers, as well as the fire chief, he has the same authority, can control as well as posting bridges, fire lanes, parking lots. Um, I don't think anybody has ever had any argument over whether or not State Street could be reconfigured. Um, up until this came back to the city for um, lead agency status under the last appellate decision, I believe it was appellate. Um, the county didn't own the property, the county doesn't, or the county owns the property, but they don't own the road. The, the road is owned by the city. And certainly if the city council wants to look at avenues for changing it, um, that's not my, um, I only look at the building plans that are submitted and tell you whether the code compliant, give the applicant their options. Um, in this case, they chose to pull an exemption, add fire features to the building, mm -hmm. and not go to you and look at reconfiguring State Street. Um, State Street isn't that old. Is it gonna be torn up? Absolutely. 
I don't think anybody has any doubt with that kind of construction, particularly now that the construction is all uh, block and steel. Um, it's a little harder to maneuver. And they will come into the exem exemption parts of it, correct? Exactly. Can you explain that? Um, well, part of the exemption, um, first of all, you, when, they, when the exemption was pointed out, the architect developed a plan. Um, on top of the sprinkler system, there's smoke vents, there's a standpipe system like high-rise buildings. There also is an access alley on the side of the building now because the building went from 300 seats down to 400. Um, so they brought a plan. This is what we're going to do to the building as an approved alternative where you accept it. And unfortunately, the burden of accepting that, and, and I can read you all sorts of places in the code, is the code enforcement officer. As all the municipalities I work with, I always go to the fire chief with every new building, uh, whether it's residential, commercial, doesn't make any difference. The Senate has a lot of commercial structures that have been built in the last two years. All of them go to the fire department for their review because the law says you have to. And that is all part of public safety, which we're all had the training, taken the test, do all the continuing education for. Um, you can question whether or not I am qualified as an ex-guy down the road. I equate that to the same way as a doctor. Mm -hmm. I would rather have a doctor that just passed college work on me than a doctor that's been there for 60 years and is kind of stuck in his ways. Because the code changes every year. Every year there's modifications. Every year there's new things that come about. And it's not a warm body class anymore. The people that were certified 10 years ago, it was a warm body class. You went and slept in the back of the room. If you signed the sheet at the end of the day, you passed. The tests you take now are consecutive and concurrent. You take one, you pass it, you go to the next course. Um, so I take real offense with you questioning my authority. No, I'm just trying to clarify what for my own self. I, your history is not on there. As far as the access road, um, they have a good plan. They have a plan that I've worked with your city code of force, uh, city fire chief with for two years. Um, is it my first choice? It doesn't matter. This is an applicant process. This is what the applicant decided they wanted to do. But there are a lot of other avenues you can look at, and there are a lot of safety features you have to look at with every building that's out there today. Um, essentially, 911 created a whole new section of the code we can look at next year, the 9-11 the catastrophes. Now anything over 10 stories, we got a whole new code coming. Um, but this is an applicant process. They chose it. The engineer developed a, a secondary plan for fire suppression. Um, and when, when we get into the aerial apparatus roads, you left out section 503.1, where required. I said that section where required. No, actually, you skipped 503. Well, 503.1. It says. Where fire apparatus roads shall be provided and maintained in accordance with section 503.1 through 503.3. We didn't get to 502 yet, did we? We haven't left the first section. Which yes, but what triggers is. the appendix D, it says specifications, fire, rated 503.2 specifications, fire apparatus access roads shall be installed, shall be installed and arranged in accordance with section 503.2.1 through 503.2.7 and over each D. other. Gentlemen, you're talking over each other and we're missing it. You missed my point. It says 503.1.1 through 503.1.3. When you go to 503.1, you have a list of where it's required within 150 feet of a building, 300 if it's sprinkled. Um, you don't get all the way down to 503.2 that refers to that if you use one of the exemptions in 503.1. Which brings me to this point here. We have an uh, availability to have the state, Department of State, Code Enforcement Division Administration make a ruling on this. I think that given this question that I have, and I, I'm sure it's gonna be a asked again and, and again and again that we get guidance from the state here Take local politics out of it, local interpretation out of it. Let's get it right from the state. That, that is an option you have. Councilor. I think that should be a condition in this Councilor. secret. Is, is that a motion, Councilor? 
I would like to amend the secret to, uh, documentation to say that we get a clarification of the code and buy off from the state here. I want them, the, the New York State Department of State Code Enforcement Division to make a decision here. Mr. Rossi, if you want to get in there. If they make a determination that it's okay, then it's okay, nobody can complain. Are, are we considering the seeker now? This is, this is, I'm adding this as a consideration. Just this second. is not Let's saying go. no to the seeker. This Let's is another Let's go. condition. Let's the order that we're doing this whole process in. Well, as you, as you know, Mr. Rossi, uh, question 18 in part two of the seeker uh, does, uh, does um, discuss uh, health and safety. So to a certain extent, there is some relevance here, but as you also know, generally code compliance uh, is uh, type two exempt material from seeker. So we're kind of we're kind of in a situation where it could be argued other both ways. But I, I think the more the, the the more compelling argument or discussion that you ought to be considering is we hire a fire chief. We hire a code enforcement officer. Let them do their job. Let's not have resolutions to tell them how to do their job. We had a the, the code, the, may I finish, sir? The code gives options. One of the options is the methodology where, which Mr. Tanner has just explained, where it can be done locally. The, the, the exemption can be done locally as it was done in this case with Mr. Tanner, Mr. Hicks, Mr. Digar, accepting, it would, it would the word A, accepting, allowing, the proffered alternative presented to them by the architects. Now there is also a provision in there that says once a year you can go to the State Review Board in Syracuse, and I think the reason they chose not to do that is because the State Review Board is not regularly held. But again, they chose, they chose an option which the law lays out for them. Because that particular option may not suit one, two, or five of you, I think it's, 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 it's wrong for you to tell these guys how to do their job. We hire experts to be fire chiefs, and then we let them be fire chiefs. We hire experts to be code officers, and we let them be code officers. So, so Mr. Rossi, I, I hate to go on, but that's my problem with the motion that's on the floor. Well, Let's let our employees do their job. Well, not only that, but I, I just want to get this back to an orderly process. You have a seeker resolution on the floor now. If there are going to be any uh, changes or motions to change or do anything different than what is in this seeker resolution, it should be done in an orderly fashion. And I'm asking you if this is on the floor, should we not then proceed to a vote on this matter and then continue on with the process? And I, and I, I would I would ask that the, the mayor do that. I don't want to I don't want to stifle uh, Mr. Rizika if he has other points to make. But making motions within a, a resolution which has already been moved and seconded does cause confusion. And, and may, I add, may I add this just as an aside? I think in 2011, you're all trying to do the right thing. The, 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 the three of you that are here and the two of you that are no longer members of this council. And it was matters like this where, oh, we ought to do this sounds like a good idea that I think got us in the mess that we were in the first place. When, when you were uh, attempting perhaps to err on the side of caution, if you will, what the court construed what you did in 2011 is start adding a bunch of other conditions. You muddied up the soup. That's why we're here. So by addition, I, I, I certainly respect Mr. Ruzika's uh, uh, opinions that we ought to have a condition about soil sampling, but we've not been ordered to do that. And I respect his latest observation that we ought to have a motion or a condition that requires us, these people to go to the state. But we weren't ordered to do that. And two meetings ago, he talked about 
let's get, bring in the DEC to see whether whether the soil uh, uh, should be handled in, in some different way than the engineer suggests. We were in order to do that. So not that any of the ideas that any of you raise are bad ideas, that's not my point. My point here is what I'm asking you to do is follow the core orders and do what we have been ordered to do. And it's really that simple. Now, now Andy, we are doing exactly what the court said. We are taking a hard look at all the changes. We, and to come up with a conditional negative declaration. I am not saying no to SECRA. I am not saying no to the project. I'm just saying we need to add conditions on, the, on this SECRA on the conditional negative deck to include soil sampling and groundwater testing because we don't know how we're, what we're mitigating there. And, I and then the other point is on this. Gentlemen, uh, council, we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? I was going to say, uh, when, when we, we do have, have a motion, a Mayor, one, just one second. We have a motion on the floor. The motion needs to be acted upon, and all this. You, I all agree. Make, I okay, agree, I'm, I'm trying to get it to that point. So, the motion, no, the, there's been a motion to table it or to request. Uh, New York State building inspection in to plus plus I would like to add the condition that we do ground water and soil sampling and determine a mitigation plan based on those results. I can't get on Counselor, that. would you repeat it for the clerk? What's the whole entire I would like us to add the condition that we do groundwater and soil sampling tests to determine the level of mitigation needed. If it determines what we need to do, the level of contamination of soil, worker exposure, all of that. The second amendment I would like to make is that we have a determination of fire safety and fire code done by either by the state or a local state rep. We have local politics in this. Sorry, P Peter, it's just. Uh... I would like the state to weigh in on the fire code issue. I would like their interpretation just as it stands, whether Appendix D, aerial apparatus road applies or not, plus the configuration of the street as it is now. This is new construction. This con street is under the control of the, the builder. They are, they're carving it up. They can reconfigure it. You getting it off? I didn't get it. I don't know where you stop and where you All right. start. Condition. I, I want. Uh, without, without. Elaborating, let, yes. Let me, just I would like motion. to add the conditions that we do look at groundwater and soil samples to determine what level of mitigation we need to do. I got that. Secondly, a fire code determination by the state on the uh, acceptability of the state, the road, road as it is with the exemptions and how uh, Appendix D applies. Thank you. Do we have a second, Mr. Rossi? No, that's fine. She got it all. I just wanted to make sure it was clear. Okay, and that was by. Like I said, this is not saying no to the project. It's not saying no to secret. It's saying it's putting in an additional con condition other than, than a sub slab soil vapor ventilation. Motion by Councilor Rizika. Do we have a second? We have no second. Motion dies. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Green, you still have the floor with Mr. Tanner. Are, 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 do you have anything else to ask of him? or? Your professional opinion, is it safe? I think it's safer than it would have been if State Street was 50 feet wide and called an apparatus road. Okay. Um, and one of the things Jeff Dyer did when we, when we took all the fire trucks out there wasn't to see if we could do it. It was to see if when we go home at night, we can sleep because we haven't jeopardized anybody's safety by utilizing an exemption that we're going to be forced and have accepted. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, yeah, it's safer than it would be if it was on Genesee Street. The only thing I, I wanted to add while I do have the floor is I know there's always talk and there has been the last three meetings I've been here in the county working with the city in different fashions of government. Hopefully, you know, everybody's watched this project um, from the council, from the college, the county, the city, as well as code enforcement and myself uh, and fire. Um, it is possible that at least small fractions of local governments can work together. They always have, Mr. Tanner. Thank you. Mr. Fusco, I, the way I understand it, at this point, here no further discussion, you would like to call for a vote on the entire seeker. Or am I, and I don't Correct, Your Honor. I, I, we have a motion and a second. I think it's the appropriate time for a roll call on the resolution that's before the board. Andy, just some quick clarification here. Uh -huh. Now, Judge Polito's already ruled on the groundwater, correct? Correct. 
and he said the college has looked at, took a hard look at that. Correct. Correct. Do you have that? Could you read that? Well, do you have it in front of you? <clears throat> Judge Polito's decision, he determined that there was adequate ingress and egress. He determined that that hard look had been hard looks had been taken on possible groundwater flow from the nearby dry cleaning business or the former nearby dry cleaning business and from the Callet department store site itself. Now, you're incorporating by reference in, in part one of your EAF, not only the CEQA review which you already conducted back in 2000, but the CEQA review which the college conducted in, uh, in uh, September of 2002. And so the, the, the issue of groundwater has already been ruled on uh, favorably, or in, a, in our favor, if you will. Further discussion? Uh, before we call the vote, Mr. Riziki, you requested all of us give our opinion why we're voting or not voting. That is a personal position, sir. You're more than welcome as you have in this in the past to say what your concerns are and why you vote or not vote for an item. I, and I get respectfully tell council the same thing. If they so desire, that's fine, but there's no mandate that we must tell you why we voted the I, way. I just respectfully request that they state the reason why they feel that that is not necessary. And from, a, and from a legal standpoint, here's why that's fraught with risk. The document, the resolution speaks for itself. Thank You're either in favor or you're against it. Clerk, call the roll, please. Councilor Graney? Yes. Councilor Camardo? Because of my position at the college and my past um, stance, I'm gonna abstain from voting, please. Councilor Smith? Aye. Councilor Rizika? For the objections that I've raised, not only to the record, but also because I feel that there's significant levels of public safety involved here, I have to say no. Mayor Quill? Aye. Carried. Uh, Your Honor, may I, at this particular time, ask now that the resolution has passed, the resolution authorizes you to sign the face page of the, uh, of the uh, environmental assessment form. I ask that we execute that right now because in the first and second lawsuits, there was an allegation that because you signed the day after, that what you were signing was something different than this council had approved. So if we could, if, if Mr. Lynch could bring it up and we sign it right in front of the television cameras, we're not gonna have that argument this time around now, are we? Take it right up. Ask to approach. Yep. Those are all the documents that we're walking today. Today's document. Yeah. He knows. Steve, the two of you will sign the preparer line since you prepared it together. Mayor, I'm going to make a motion. We take a five-minute recess if possible. Motion not necessary, Council. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be in recess for 10 minutes. Two of you stand together and date it tonight. <laughs> We will run back, resume back to our agenda, ordinances, no. resolutions, no. local laws, table legislation, no. other business. We'll start out with Mr. Talbot, presentation on the city tree program. Everybody have a copy? Yeah. Yep. 
came in a package. Give me one second here. <coughs> okay, thanks for the time tonight. This, um, I know it came up at council a few sessions ago about a update on the program that, uh, that's that been ongoing and it's been completed, so we'll just go uh, over it briefly and hit the high points of it. Uh, a little bit of a, hi a history, the city's maintained an urban forestry program for decades. You can go back in the old council minutes and they refer to our tree inventory as, as early as the early 1900s, so we're real proud of that. Uh, council should be proud of that also that you're maintaining and, uh, and our commitment to it. We rely heavily on resident requests in addition to staff observations and we still require the request forms we've gone over before. They can be downloaded at our website. Uh, you just go to the forms and document tab and all of our tree city ordinance is governed under chapter 277 trees and it's pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty clear. Uh, once again, we have an extensive history of a commitment to maintain our tree inventory. Efforts of staff and volunteers have proven effective over the years and we want to continue to maintain that effort. A uh, cr critical part of maintaining our inventory, a healthy inventory, is the removal of disease, stress, or older trees that pose a threat. And that's where this program came in. Uh, due to a number of factors, we're going on those before, uh, the backlog of trees to be removed was just way too extensive for our current staffing level. And as a result, claims against the city due to property damage from city trees, uh, they were increasing. In addition, tree damage due to storms and inclement weather were also increasing. And uh, fortunately, the last few wind events we've had, uh, we've had minimal damage to any structures, roads, property, cars, and uh, Corporation Council, I think you've probably seen a decrease in tree-related requests or concerns or claims. So, uh, you know, the program has been effective. Uh, council back in 2010 initiated this project, uh, Financial Resolution 163 of 2010. Program was the last three years, consisted of tree removal, stump grinding, and some tree replanting. Uh, the removal list was determined by us at Public Works and the forms, we went through our history of forms and field observations. And we tried to prioritize the trees that we were really looking at to uh, take down. What we did is, uh, like we do with a lot of our larger projects, we broke the city down into four quadrants. Uh, the actual action came, we performed, but what it worked out best is when we performed four days of removal per week we averaged about two and a half trees per day depending on the size and other obstructions. Sometimes we got more, sometimes just a little bit less. We were removed for three weeks and then we'd stump for one week to stay current and avoid a, just a tremendous stumping backlog. Because sometimes there's nothing worse than uh, seeing just a, a stump sitting there. I think it sends, sends the wrong message. Program costs, we used the Cuga County uh, list on vendors and uh, it was two thousand dollars a day that included a tree truck a chipper truck the crane truck is key and also uh, they provided a three-person crew now a crane truck which we don't have uh, you're able to not just rope and drop the sections of tree but actually crane it to the ground so it really minimizes any damage to curbing sidewalks property and uh, really I'm, I'm, uh, I'm aware of just one broken sidewalk during this entire project and really we were not really convinced it was due to our activities that some of the brakes looked a little bit old but we were able to make it right for the person. In addition, we provided a loader and one to two dump trucks to take the logs to the landfill compost area. Uh, the stumping portion, it's $125 an hour. That included a pickup truck, a stumper and a one-man crew. We provided a loader and the dump truck to remove the chips that don't fit back into the holes. Now the areas, area one was done in the winter of 2010-11. You can see uh, the effort at the time, we went a little bit heavy on the removal, 236 trees. Area two was a little bit more realistic about 
how we, the numbers we anticipated, 77 trees. Now areas three and four we did together from the winter of 2003 to spring of this year and 134 trees were removed. Now the tally that a 447 trees removed a result of the program and in addition to that program, we also had our own forces out, removed an additional 87 trees, which wasn't covered under the initial $200,000 bonding for the project. But we did include it in the, uh, when we go to stump and everything. Now the financials of this project, we bonded for $200,000 and we really kept a close watch on every dollar we spent. We've spent 183,000 of this. Uh, if you take just the bonding amount, and I'll go into the math a little bit differently because I look at things a little bit differently than just uh, the contractor cost because also we participated and also with staffing. So this is just apply, this expense per tree is applied specifically to the bonding. So, and we spent $6,300 on the replanting, which was 73 trees. And really, as, we, as I talk a little bit, we'll, we're gonna get a lot more aggressive with our replanting and really get the neighborhoods involved because there's a couple different ways to do it. So out of the uh, bonded amount, the least 16, a little over $16,000. And what, you know, the uses of that remaining balance for replanting or any other problem trees that really jump out at us. Now, if you take, I estimated we used about, on, over the entire project, probably about $90,000 out of our general fund, not out of the uh, fund balance, but out of our actual operating budget. And if you do the math on that, it breaks down to be about $611 per tree, which is, is if anyone knows, if ever had to employ a tree contractor, that's a good price. And that was the whole idea behind the kind of the bulk, the bulk rate of removal. So it really, uh, we met our goals. And like I said, we watched every dollar. Uh, we, we documented every address we were at, so we, we know exactly where we are. Now our efforts today, uh, we wanna maintain now our tree inventory. We're pretty much caught up. Uh, we wanna do a little better job at surveying our trees. That doesn't mean with a transit and all that. That means just knowing what we have out there in quantities. Our problem trees were gonna to continue to be removed or trimmed. We're still, I like to see more trimming than removal at this point. Uh, we just submitted a grant application and we're really optimistic about that. I think the timing is right with the state and what that's gonna allow us to do is develop a, a good tree inventory management plan with all street and park trees located, meaning with, uh, with uh, in, you know, right to the uh, latitude and longitude. So we'll be able to really, really stay up on removals and plantings with definitive locations so we could plot it all. I really, I think we could do a better job and that's what we're gonna concentrate on hopefully over the winter uh, is concentrate on community involvement and for the replanting of our neighborhood street and city park trees because there's two different kinds of uh, public trees. There's street trees and there's park trees. So we'd like to hear a lot from the people and we're working on some forms to get out. And uh, we're really right now uh, concentrating on a f fall, early winter planting with bare root trees because for the price of the trees and the amount of labor it takes, that's the best bang for our buck as far as the, the trees. So we have a good solid uh, list of planting locations and their addresses. So uh, we're really going to, we're optimistic about this, this fall and it's a good way to get everybody involved. Park trees, uh, talk about replanting limits because it's just, you just can't plant a tree everywhere. I think that's where we've made a mistake in past of some species probably planted areas where they're not supposed to be, they grow too big for, or too wide. So park trees, are, it's easier to find adequate locations than street trees. Some of the street tree limitations, uh, the, the, you know, there's overhead power lines, there's underground utilities, including gas, sewer, water, electric, et cetera. Because back in the day when we go to stump, we have the UFPO, each location because we are breaking the surface and it's, uh, we've run into a few instances where the tree has actually grown around the water box or a gas line or an electrical line. So it can get a little bit dicey when in that situation. So that's what we're, that's what we're gonna avoid in the future. And also not planting silver maples under power lines or any, a tree that's gonna grow to be 80 feet. It just doesn't make sense to plant it in some locations. So we've broken it down in three different varieties, small, medium, and large. And uh, you know, people can have as much input as they want. Unfortunately, if they like a large tree and it's just not conducive to and appropriate for that location, we, we're not gonna allow it to be planted. 
but we'll, we'll always settle on something that they, can, that they feel good about. So we encourage everybody to consider planting. Like I said, sometimes per the code, with setbacks from street corners, uh, some locations ju we just can't plant, but most of them are gonna be okay, provided there's nothing overhead or underground. Uh, the, the, you could go on to the benefits of trees for a long time, uh, but some of the more, more simple ones, you know, it really does add beauty, natural color, provides color, shapes, and forms for everybody to enjoy. Uh, you know, some of the best artwork, painting, poetry, story writing always includes some form of trees, so it, it's a motivation for a lot of people. Provides privacy and a sense of security, reduces air pollution, you could go on forever on the benefits of that. Conserves water and reduces soil erosion. Saves energy, keeps our homes cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. Reduces noise pollution. I know the guys on the garbage trucks love a, a, a nice canopy over them come August when uh, they've been at it for about four hours. And let me tell you, you can really tell the difference in temperature when you come off a hot street with no trees, turn onto a tree that has a nice canopy and it really makes a difference. Creates wildlife and plant diversity increases property values, marks the seasons, which is important. Everyone looks forward to the smell of burning leaves in the air. Not that they do it in the city, but you know, and then, you, then you have to rake, but that's okay. <laughs> Shields people from ultraviolet rays, and it does slow traffic. Studies are out there that it really does make a difference and people tend to drive more slowly. Questions, counsel? Mike, sorry, you have more? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, there's a little more, but we can... Oh, okay, no, go nope. right ahead. No, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, please. No, nope. this, uh, you know, I call this new life. This is what our new trees will look when we install them. Um, what we want to do is, is give the homeowners a care man, not a care, but a, but a care sheet of things they should also do. This is, I just threw this in there. This is what we currently do. We have one tree trimmer. We have one tree truck and you know that he and the truck are supported by other public works departments. And the budget, if you remember during the budget process, we reduced our budgets, our budget here. So we're really watching our dollars, uh, mostly in the um, services line, which is the contractors out there that can perform the service that we can. There's our tree truck. Uh, you know, thanks to the council for approving this purchase last year, it's 2012, and it really uh, makes a difference. We can get up higher and more safely. Tree removals, we've all seen this before. What, we want, what we're gonna continue to do is plot each removal. We're not up to that. We haven't done the whole thing yet, but once we get on, uh, you know, GPS and hopefully through the inventory management plan, uh, we'll, we'll be up, be able to keep better track of it. These are the street plannings. There's different ways to look at it. Uh, it's hard to see really much, much progress when you scatter some plannings around, but what we might do is identify specific areas like a street. The one that comes out we looked at today and you know, there's probably 20 to 25 conducive places for trees is along Swift Street that experienced a lot of removals. So now the next phase is to replant and uh, we're optimistic about that. This again is the cursory survey we did. We had a, uh, a meeting today out of Cornell Cooperative Extension is uh, the Emerald Ash Borer, we've all heard about it. It, it, it is in Cuga County now, it's been documented in a trap. So it's, it's on its way and uh, there'll be some issues with us with that. So, um, you know, we're gonna have to develop some plans which we're working on now. So, but I know it's hard, a lot of people don't think of our tree inventory really is an, an asset, but, and I just, uh, and this is, these are estimates, just street trees, not park trees. If you do the math on those four quadrants that we did, roughly there's 8,200 street trees. You put a, uh, which I think is a low value of roughly $250 per tree. The math equates to over $2 million in assets just in our trees. So I think we really need to start looking at that. A lot of people call, and I think uh, counselors, Mayor, everybody receives a lot of tree calls and they're usually not good. I want the tree gone for whatever reasons and you know, it's our job, what we try to do is to not talk them down but explain to them why we're just not gonna take it down because they don't wanna rake or they wanna see the street a little better from their picture window. So I hope everyone can understand if they don't get the answer that they like that we have to think of the city as, a, as the entire city and what's best for everybody. So uh, we try to do our best. I know a lot of people are unhappy. Most people are happy. 
So, uh, and if anyone, uh, if anyone noticed in front of the construction there for Plans of the Arts, they removed four of our trees. Now, in their approved site plan, they're gonna replace that when the construction's over and they finished their sidewalk. So Mike, don't be alarmed, they did remove four trees. They will be replaced at their expense. While we're talking about downtown on State Street, there was a couple of streets trees taken out did they die or were they the bottom there's also yeah. one more that yeah they uh and unfortunately you know trees are living things when we when we go to plant we don't have the money to do really any soil testing so there's chemistry involved we try to pick the most suitable sites some areas get more salt in the winter than others so the species that we've currently find success with, those are the ones we're gonna stay with. And also, if you notice along Loop Road also, some trees just didn't make it. So are they gonna get replanted on State Street then? Yeah, but we're gonna wait for a little bit for, it seems like there might be some activity in that area. There's one that's dead right now we're gonna pull out. Also, while I'm on it, the, uh, if everyone has a chance, when you walk on Genesee Street, what we did is installed at no cost to the city, flexi pave around the base of three trees. And hopefully with this grant, if we're successful, which like I said, we really got our fingers crossed, what we'd like to do is put these around all of our trees within downtown. There's three different colors. Uh, everyone has their favorites. We'd like everybody to weigh in, whether you're a business owner or walking by. Uh, the advantages of this, uh, water, uh, water infiltrates right through. It reduces soil erosion, stormwater runoff. And uh, as you know, this, this field grates when our tree grows, they're a tripping hazard. Now when our trees grow, we have to do is take a razor knife and trim a little bit around. So a lot of advantages to it. I want more weeping willow trees. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're rough. Like, yeah. You like to see them drop, right? Yeah. Like just to comment on them tree grates, we went to a great deal of expense to get those grates. It was only four or five years ago. Yeah. You know. And, you know, um, some of the yeah, trees have outgrown the great size. They were about $1,800 a tree, I believe. Yeah. I, I, How different is the city situation as far as the trees go? Right. Oh, it's been positive. Yeah, know. absolutely. One thing I do have to comment, a uh, uh, couple people I know, I've uh, sent them your way regarding a, a tree issue they had, and, and, and they were very satisfied. In fact, uh, they told me that you did, you, your guys did a great job, and they said to, you know, they told them when the stumps were going to be taken out, and, and they took them out when they promised. That's good to hear. And that's, you know, we encourage everybody to call, whether they have a question or an observation. Mike, I don't know if you took care of this. Um, a family gave me a call. They were, well, it's not funny, but they were at Clifford Park, and they were just laying down eating the sub, and a good-sized branch fell within 10 feet. And they said there's a couple trees in Clifford Park that we might want to look at okay. um, that are dead. So just taking advantage of yeah. the discussion. Now, are we still planning right now? No, we're plan we're we're going to do a late October, early November planting. Okay, in the fall. So, though. and if uh, anyone listening out there, we have a list right now of people who've contacted us interested. If you're not on that list or you think you, we may have forgotten you, please call us or email me or call us down at the office. We'll make sure you're on and then we'll come out. What we're going to do is come out, look at the locations. Um, because really, bare root is the way to go in the fall, simply because you can do more of them. Uh, in the springtime, we'd like to do another one with a different type called, you know, bald and burlap, which are a little bit bigger. So, Mike, you said that uh, you get many, or you get many phone calls. We get many phone calls. The ones I always enjoyed is they want their neighbor's tree cut down. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I thank you and, and Jerry before you to go out and, to, and investigate it. So uh, normally there's nothing wrong with the tree. They just don't like it. So well, it can get dicey at times. And like I said, trees, whether you know it or not, affect everybody. You know, you might not like trees. You might not even notice the trees. But I'll guarantee if you remove a tree, then you notice it. Hey, what was there? You know, um, is any any other tree questions? Yeah, Mike, how many how many have you planted so far and how many to plan on planting? Well, we, we planted 73, mm -hmm. and we hope to, I'd like to see our goal of possibly planting up to 100 per year for the next 10 years. Of course, once you get, you know, the, the ideal planting locations quickly get filled up, so you have to get a little bit more creative. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like I said, we can always find some spots in some of our parks, but I, I, I think it's important. I think it's a good way to, uh, 
once again, you, you, you know, beat the same drum, but connect the generations. There's nothing more enjoyable than spending a, a Saturday afternoon sunny with, you know, different age groups planting trees. Uh, it's a good way for neighbors to mingle. It's a good way for, for everybody to t participate. And you know, once you start a little section and it gets cleaned up, it's contagious and everybody wants their neighborhoods to look nice. So. Mike, part of that grant was uh, money to purchase trees to plant, right? Yes. Yep. And what we were going to do with the grant is concentrate on downtown for species down there. Mike, can we switch gear? Councilor, you got something on trees, though? Yeah, a couple more. Yeah, please. Jenny, on the CDBG program, when we do the sidewalks, are we mm -hmm. still looking at taking and removing some of these trees that might yes. be an obstacle? Yes. Um, we have done that, and um, we, we specifically... I think DPW had done some tree removals, um, and yep. we, we reimbursed uh, their budget um, with CDBG funds to yep. do that. And in that instance, Councillor, when there's a tree that just has to be removed because there's a sidewalk going in, because the process is if there's an existing sidewalk where the sidewalk's going, they're replacing it or installing a new one, they're gonna have to grind some stumps or some roots. And we all know what happens then. It's not healthy for the tree. It's not healthy for anybody sometimes to the extent that it, they get ground down. So what we'll do is encourage that person who had to have a tree removed, they have a sidewalk put in to replant somewhere in close proximity. And there's still a lot of bad trees out there. I think yeah. At some point we should look at doing a similar program. Yeah. And this, uh, you know, once again, I, I can't uh, commend council enough for initiating this because it was much needed and uh, it's really, you know, it, it's, the intent wasn't the shock and of pancake in our neighborhoods, but it was to really thin or update our inventory, I guess is the way I, to put it, with what we replant appropriate for the locations. There was some Yeah. Yeah. Mike, if we could switch gears a minute. We <clears throat> spoke earlier today, and, and I'm sure council is getting the same question about the water level at Hoops Park. Mm -hmm. Give us just a brief description as to why and what for. Right. Well, how, how fitting uh, that we had a watershed presentation when <laughs> really what we should probably do is really delineate our Hoops Park pond watershed because that has its own watershed mm -hmm. and what everyone's doing upstream really affects the health of the pond so what we've done is lowered the pond elevation so we can really take a good look at what the what's at the bottom we everyone knows we had a there's a lot of algae on top at times and there's a lot of seaweed growth so what was happening is the seaweed was getting into the pumps for the fountains and it was sucking it right in and burns out the pumps so we dropped the elevation. I know a couple of the councilors have been out there, a couple have been in the pond, uh, shoveling and moving stuff around, and, what, and Doug's been involved. And what we're trying to do is create some movement of some of the silt and some of the uh, solids that enter from the south there and kind of push them towards the outlet. But it's still, the, the goal here is for the overall health of the pond. Uh, there's a lot of different things that go into the health of a pond, everything from chemistry to your, your fish quantities and types and uh, one positive though we were able to get there's two big snapping turtles out there and that's the cause of the one-legged ducks so we were able to we were able to get the uh, one of the snapping turtles and he's in it we're going to relocate them and there's another bigger one out there that I don't think will fit in the trash can that's out there but that's one of the positives the other positive we're able to actually look at the pond bottom and what's been built up because unfortunately there's been some uh, some development upgrading and of course during the heavy rains like uh, Katie said everything ends up in your watershed into your uh, your body wherever that is and ours is Hoops Park right here, the pond Mike. so I appreciate everybody's patience who lives in close proximity because unlike uh, you know uh, the uh, inconvenience of bridge work or one lane traffic you can cuss out the crew and go on your way here if you're walking the pond it's always there. You see, just it looks like no progress, but there is progress being made. Uh, soil and water is come and looked at. If there's experts in the field, we hope to get down there because, like I said, everything from the chemistry of the groundwater, the chemistry of the pond water, the muck at the bottom, you know, uh, the uh, aquatic life in there, the the land life that uses it. It's uh, everything plays a part. Do you see dredging in the future, Mike, or is that well, part of this? I think that's. Uh, I think dredging is an option to remove that silt layer and get it back down to the bottom elevation that the pond is supposed to be. Uh, maybe, you know, introducing some more flow 
is another option, the simplest and cheapest option that we're gonna try. You know, we're trying to stay away from chemical treatment and all those things. We're trying to do everything mechanical that we can right now. And I think that's, and like I said, folks, I know it's an inconvenience, it's, it smells at times, it's ugly, but it's, it's for the health of the, of the pond itself. So, unfortunately, like I said, what's occurred upstream has really affected us downstream. I have to comment that uh, that Councilor Graney uh, took that problem uh, and, and tried to, uh, or is an attempt in, in the process of, I should say, trying to, to find a, a, a cheap, low-end mechanical solution. Yep. He had me out there looking at a pump, and uh, I guess now we're going to, the concern is, you know, I said, well, you got a big pump here, you're going to have to cut the wheel, or uh, now I guess Denny, uh, Denny Zach said that we can possibly put in a VFD and slow it down. Uh, right now, it's a, a you know it's a huge capacity for that pump. It'll turn it into a, a whirlpool if you let it go. It's a thousand GPM, so we've got to get that capacity has got to be reduced by. And I think it's going to re require uh, changing the speed of the driver as well as a, as an impeller trim. We're going to try to mock it up and take a run at it and see what happens. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And also, I think uh, on a much smaller scale of what Katie deals with, I think we should establish and delineate who is in our watershed for the pond there and just maybe inform them about what they're doing, letting their dog do or letting mm -hmm. whatever, if they're treating their lawns, it's going to end up in our pond. Yeah. You know, I, I know personally I've been down there with Doug Kears from Saloon Water yeah. a couple, two, three times, and he suggests dredging it out yeah. in, in the fall. You know, they're willing to help us out on that. Yeah, that would uh, that would really make a difference, and then we could concentrate on water quality itself, and uh, you know, maybe some of the weed-eating fish that can go in. I, I know they used to have summer help go out there in rowboats and harvest. Uh, I, I'm sure that that uh, you know, it's probably hard to find somebody that wants to go out there row and, and cut weeds. <laughs> well, one of the problems is the the bottom is filled up with so much silt that. When the sunlight hits, hits it, it just grows it really quick. It's, yeah, it's, it's too really shallow. shallow. And fact, it's at some warm. Point you can walk almost walk across it. But uh, rest assured, everyone, we we understand and we realize the importance of that park, specifically the pond, in this conversation to all of our quality of life and all the people who enter the city from that end. A, a number of years ago, I remember the, the level was brought down and we actually put some equipment in there to clean it out and uh, remove some of the it silt. Was five years ago. Yeah. We ran into some uh, weather problems. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be nice and frozen to. Yeah, I know it's move. been too, uh, too, actually too warm this past winter to, to get out there and put a piece of equipment out. But hopefully, a positive, like I said, is less one-legged ducks, and uh, hopefully, they can survive. Well, that you got one turtle remaining. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if it's large enough. Maybe uh, the DPW could have you know turtle soup. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> All right, thank you. Council, your turn. No offense to Jenny, but uh, I'll wait for Doug for other business. It, when is Doug coming back? Next week. Next, okay. He's due back this weekend. He's back this weekend, okay. John, uh, I see you sent us out a memo on uh, a letter you just sent to uh, Mr. Freeman. Would you mind going over that? Uh, yeah, basically, uh, it was, at, I think, your inquiry right. regarding mm -hmm. executive session. Yep. And uh, as the letter stated, I, I think everyone received a copy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they're very efficient there. Uh, two weeks later, I got an, the same letter uh, with a different date, but the yeah, same yeah, context. Yeah. But it, it basically says that when you go into executive session, you have to, first of all, uh, specifically identify the subject matters that you are uh, going into executive session for. And when you are in executive session, you cannot deviate from those items. You, it has to be restricted only to those items. That's it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. um, very good. And they've been uh, very responsive. It, it was interesting. I had a matter last week and uh, called the office and Bob Freeman answered the phone. And, uh, we had a nice conversation. Good. So. Well, good. Thank you for following <coughs> up on that then. Yeah, I have to comment about Bob Freeman. He's, he seems like he, he really takes that job to heart. He's always available. He'll return calls, everything. I mean, the, the guy's phenomenal. He's, He's the good. author of the uh, legislation from day yeah. one. He's the atypical state worker. <laughs> Re recap. I have uh, Councilor Camaro asked 
at the city manager update council on the reorganization on the budget yep give uh details on the um claims list there was three thousand thirty thousand dollars to bond shenick and king and uh report on the overtime since september 1st for the fire department that's all i have is that correct council yes do we have a request for executive session? As a matter of fact, we do, Your Honor, and that there will be two contract matters and one litigation, and they should not be too long. Uh, Very good. This time, I entertain a motion to, for executive session, Councilor Camardo, seconded by Councilor Graney. Councilor Graney? Yes. Councilor Camardo? Yes. Councilor Smith? Aye. Councilor Rizika? Yes. Mayor Quill? Aye. We're in recess for executive session.